Chair, members of the board. It's 9.30 a.m. Today is Thursday, August 6th. Uh, my name is Brian Zumwalt. I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. Uh, as usual, let's go ahead and do a quick roll call, and then we'll hand it over to our board chair. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, can you hear me okay? Yeah, good morning. I can hear you fine, Brian. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Seal. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Welch. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Commissioner Long. You're muted, Commissioner Long. I said, here I am. Good morning. Good morning <laughs> to you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Commissioner Peters. Good morning, Brian. I'm here. All right. And Commissioner Gerard. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> well, Someone, please turn off their cell phone. <laughs> okay. All right, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, before we get into our uh, citizens to be heard, um, we'd like to recognize the fact that tomorrow is Purple Heart Day, and I think Dave has something he'd like to say. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. That um, Several years ago, this commission uh, joined several cities and the state in Rec deciding to recognize our Purple Heart recipients, uh, folks that uh, in our county that uh, had earned that distinction. And uh, really proud of this commission. And tomorrow is Purple Heart Day. And normally we'd be having ceremonies around the county. Um, and I just didn't want us to lose sight of that. Um, certainly trying to bring context and a little of, I don't know, perspective to what's going on in our crazy world. Um, pandemic and just a lot of the things that we we recognize on our on our TVs every night. Um, and this week we lost eight eight servicemen uh, in training session off the coast of California. And, um, you know, just again, putting in perspective what awesome people we have in this country um, and what they do for us every day. And so um, again, thank you for allowing me just a moment. And if you don't mind, just take a, just a moment of silence to recognize those eight sailors who died. And then uh, I'll be back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Um, okay. First up, we have citizens to be heard. Um, since this is a work, well, yes, it is a work session, right? <laughs> the only issue we have to be voting on is the local state of emergency. So please try to confine your comments to that. Um, Brian, do we have anybody on the line? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on the local state of emergency, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine if you're on the telephone. Um, and Madam Chair, we do have one person that wishes to speak. Uh, our first speaker is Don. I do not have the last name. So Don, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, you'll have uh, three minutes to address the board. And by the way, give um, us your first last name and address, please. Okay. And this is on the state of local state of emergency, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my name is Don Bowler, B as in boy, O-H-L-E-R. I live at 6678 54th Avenue North, St. Petersburg. Uh, first, in 2012, Dr. Cho was named interim director of the Florida Department of Health in Polk County in early 2015, assumed the interim director position in Hardy County, and in 2016 as director here at age 36, hired to follow the Pinellas County Community Health Improvement Plan that stressed the importance of behavioral health with efforts to make behavioral health a priority, improve access to care, and help residents achieve a healthy weight. Prior to March, was this still your primary duty? If not, what was? Next, instead of becoming a practicing physician, you went into public health and I quote, as a physician, you treat one patient at a time. In public health, you have the opportunity to treat the whole population. It takes approximately 10 years to become an infectious disease doctor. If this education started when you were 18, practiced immediately at age 28, it leaves only eight years to gain experience of which four of those years were focused in the Department of Health. So in light of transparency, how many infectious disease patients have you personally treated? To what level of the infectious disease were they classified? And how many COVID patients have you personally cared for since March? During the absent years, what did you do? Finally, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic infected 60.8 million Americans 
in 19 months, whereas in five months of COVID, we are at 4.85 million. If we were to stay, stay on the same infection rate in the same time frame, COVID case numbers would only add up to around 19.4 million. Can each of you explain how the mandates and the continuously pushing back the goalposts are justifiable when H1N1 cases were by far worse than COVID, had only a declared national emergency that allowed public health agencies as well as doctors and hospitals to bypass certain requirements, FDA permission to use the investigation, the investigational antiviral primavir, and freed up supplies of Tamiflu and Relenza, yet there were no shutdowns, no restrictions, and no measures taken to prevent that spread. Thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, we do have another speaker. Oh, okay. uh, uh, Ms. Karen Mullins. Uh, Ms. Mullins, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good morning, everybody. Karen Mullins, M-U-L-L-I-N-S, Dunedin, Florida. I just want to repeat the, the color before. H1N1 had some immunity, had some herd immunity because it had been seen before in our, in our population. I personally got H1N1. It was not a fun, a fun virus to have. I lost a friend to H1N1. But again, we had the ability to fight it. There was a um, vaccine in the works almost immediately. And we had a game plan. We, ha we knew how to deal with it. The COVID-19, we don't know what it is. We don't know the outfall of this virus. We are seeing some tremendous, tremendous uh, symptoms after the virus has been supposedly cured. So please, please stay with the science and good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I had to say that. Good morning, thank you. Um, do we want to, um, Mr. Administrator, do a, uh, a rundown of where we are? Or Madam Chair, yes, I, I think um, just to, for the context of the public, uh, the commissioners listen in on the executive policy committee calls where we update our numbers and the strategies we have. Um, I think from an overall standpoint, the strategies of uh, the um, wearing of masks, the limiting the large crowds at like bars and other things. And, and of course, the state has regulation on that, but we have local regulation also. And the public education is having an impact. I would like for Dr. Cho to give you um, an overview of our numbers and the trends that they're seeing from a health perspective. Dr. Jamison is also on the line and he is a practicing physician in a ER, so he sees firsthand. Um, and then I can kind of highlight some of the larger strategies around our nursing homes, uh, staffing at hospitals and uh, testing. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, in terms of some of our trends and our numbers, uh, we have seen an overall improvement over the last few weeks. Um, uh, looking at some of the numbers, um, there has been 17,359 cases cumulatively. Now, in terms of the, the seven-day rolling uh, counts, uh, we have, again, seen some improvements there uh, with the case count um, averaging 184 daily. This is a big improvement from last week where we've been seeing uh, 200, 220s to 230s. Um, there has been some decrease in testing, uh, decreased demand at some of our sites as well, as some interruptions with the hurricane, but this is reassuring. Uh, now in terms of the seven day rolling percent positivity, we're now at uh, 6% seven day rolling, um, which is also an improvement. We were at 7% uh, for a good portion of last week. Uh, this is probably one of the better percent positivities also in the Bay Area. Uh, but again, I, I do want to stress that we do have in Pinellas County a large vulnerable population here. Um, and as a result, we will see some, sometimes disproportionately impacts uh, as it pertains to complications and deaths. Uh, yesterday, we saw 467 deaths related to COVID. Um, uh, and overall, we have seen that increase over the last uh, six weeks. Um, however, uh, there has been a decline and improvement of those numbers over the last two weeks. Uh, it, it continues to impact uh, more so the uh, vulnerable populations. The mean age uh, has been 80 with 89% of death occurring uh, for those older than uh, 65 years of age. 
Now, 69% of the deaths have come from the long-term care facilities, which really underscores that importance of continuing to work with those facilities as it pertains to infection control practices, um, as well as testing when we do start seeing those cases. Now, in terms of hospital uh, healthcare system capacity, uh, the healthcare uh, capacity has been stable over the past two weeks. The numbers of COVID patients in the hospitals, ICU beds, and on vents have declined over that time span. And uh, as of this morning, we have 330 uh, hospitalized COVID patients uh, in Pinellas County, uh, 68 in the ICU, and 37 on vents. Uh, we are making some headway here in Pinellas County, and we have uh, but we do have a long way to go in terms of battling this pandemic. And if this was a football game, we we're probably only in the second quarter. Um, so I think the message is that we need to, we cannot be complacent. Uh, we must not fall victim to COVID fatigue, um, just with this drawn out sort of course of this disease. We need to keep it up and continue with the social distancing practices and wearing masks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Cho, and, and maybe this is for someone else on the, the team, but um, early on, we talked about our EMS folks and our fire department folks visiting every one of our long-term care facilities. Uh, have we done all of that? Have, have there been trainings at every facility? Kind of give us an idea of where we are at with our communication with those long-term care facilities and their, their training and upgrades. Okay. So uh, we, have a great, we have a great partnership. We've developed here a long-term care a task force comprised of DOH, uh, emergency management, county government, the hospitals, our fire departments. They've been a huge partner to us. Uh, they visited all of our 250 um, uh, nursing homes as well as long-term care facilities, providing some of the training, um, looking at their PPE needs along with emergency management. Um, and when uh, we uh, at the Department of Health side work, continues to work with those facilities, um, when they do have cases, look at some of their needs, help uh, utilize state resources for uh, staffing augmentation, uh, having nurses there when needed, assist with capacity, uh, testing capacities as well. Uh, and as you're probably aware, the state's also uh, instituted a, a, a two week, a testing every two weeks for all the staff members in those facilities as well. So, um, and beyond that too, uh, the, the great work of trying to find these super sniffs, these dedicated COVID um, uh, sites have uh, proven invaluable to both the, the long-term care facilities and the hospital systems at large. Well, that was gonna be my follow-up about uh, with, with the skilled nursing, the super skilled nursing facilities, um, we've been able to uh, alleviate the hospital population that really didn't need hospital care, isn't that correct? Right, and I think that, that contributed to the improvements of, of those uh, COVID patients within the hospital setting. So I think that is a contributing factor there. And Dr. Jamison can, can highlight exactly what he's seeing both from an EMS side and you know from a nursing home side, but we have two super sniffs right now working on two more. Um, the, we also, by the ramping up of the testing, also um, gave an outlet for people not to go to the ER to get tested. So all of these um, individual issues, along with working with the state to modify the uh, regulations regarding when they can release a nursing home resident back to a super sniff or back to the nursing home has helped with, the hospital, with our hospital capacity and in particular our ERs. Dr. Jameson, anything to add on that? Uh, no, other than to say that I'm, I'm just so proud of the work of all of the EMTs and paramedics, uh, both at our fire departments and at Sunstar. They have just done an amazing job um, taking on the additional role of helping to support those long-term care facilities in the midst of, of doing their usual duties. And they, they've done it just in a fantastic way. Um, we continue to see um, a slightly below normal call volume based on the last numbers I saw, but uh, we are seeing... Um, at least, at least a feels like of uh, more severe uh, disease in folks. And I, I do continue to worry about people uh, being reluctant to access the hospitals and reluctant to access medical care. Uh, and I do want to encourage folks uh, that if they are having a medical emergency to please go ahead and either call 911 or go to the hospital. Uh, please don't, uh, don't put that off and wait until things get worse. We are seeing more and more evidence uh, of things like delayed diagnosis of everything up to and including cancer uh, as a result of, of this pandemic. And so I do want to put that message out that, that you know, people need to 
uh, feel comfortable and confident that the healthcare system is doing everything they can to keep them safe. Uh, and that if you have an, an issue, you should go to the hospital. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, first just uh, thank Dr. Cho and Dr. Jamison for continuing to provide us with the facts, the straight facts. And I know they didn't get into this game for politics and some of the hits they take. And I just want to publicly thank them for keeping us um, you know, focused on, on what matters. And as Barry said, you know, we are seeing the impact of you know, our policy decisions that were based on the science, the maths, the distancing, the bars and other things. So, um, you know, this is the way it, it should work. And, and I'm so proud of our community for their work. Uh, Dr. Cho answered most of my questions. I did have one question just on our dashboards. The Times uh, article this morning showed, as Dr. Cho said, that we have, you know, the most deaths in the Bay Area at 469 is what they showed. And then also the highest um, death rate of any county. And that's because of the long-term long care facilities. But I couldn't find any trend data that shows, you know, we have trend data for cases and for testing and percent positivity over time. I can't see any trend data for deaths. And is that something that's available and I just don't know where it is or can we put that up so folks can see that we're actually doing better and there are spikes based on individual cases at long-term care facilities. Do we have something like that, Barry? Uh, I'll defer to Dr. Chair regarding the deaths. I don't have that particular type of data. What I can show you, is, and you can see from the last chart, is the um, it, we have the overall trends of the number of cases and the new cases by week. Um, that, that does show a declining in our long-term care facilities slightly, still high, but, right. but slightly. Um, but I can, I'll defer to Dr. Chair regarding the death rates. Okay. So I, I so I don't think on the dashboard we do have the the trends of the the death, and certainly we can talk to the the team regarding that. Um, but but uh, in lieu of that, I can provide you some of the information. I, I think um, in terms of the numbers that do come out, it's the death that are reported. It's not really um, marked by the uh, the date of death, which I think is more accurate marker. So we do track that, and I certainly can share that with you. Okay, and are we act doing better in terms of deaths? I mean, we could have had spikes early on that are still reflecting in that overall rate. So I'm trying to understand, are we doing better recently than, than we were uh, prior? So I, I, can, I can tell you with that last peak that we saw, and sometimes there is that lag uh, with uh, severe uh, complications as well as deaths. Uh, I can tell you over the last six to seven weeks, uh, that's uh, um, the 73 percent of our deaths have occurred in that time frame. So, okay. so the majority of our deaths have occurred in sort of a shorter time frame. Uh, but uh, if you look at that weekly count of deaths, we have improved uh, or decreased in that number over the last two weeks. Okay. But Commissioner you. Wells, to your point, yeah. uh, to your point, I just want to, this is more of a statement rather than facts, but we're really trying to reach, and this is the education piece, to understand, especially for younger people, that um, where we have the community spread, there are nurses, there are CNAs, they're in our hospitals, they're in our long-term care facilities, and we have over 250 long-term care facilities here in this county, far more than other counties. Our average age in this county because of long-term care is over 10 years greater than it is in Hillsborough, for instance. And so that that it puts us at a higher risk. So it's not about you know the, you and your friends. It's it's really about caring for our most vulnerable. And that's the, been the concern all along. That's been the education piece. That's the reason I'm so grateful for our fire and EMS folks to work with our nursing homes and make sure they're doing everything they can to prevent this spread and from it coming into the facility because it has a major impact um, on our residents there. Agreed, Barry. Madam Chair, just one other item. Um, mm -hmm. Y'all have done some fantastic work on testing. Can you just update us quickly on uh, what's happening with testing in Pinellas? So we have, so our Mahaffey site, so we uh, we have the Mahaffey site. Uh, that site is running well. If you need a test, um, we encourage you to go there. There's been a couple of pop-ups uh, sites, but we also have the community health centers uh, that have three different sites, um, our health department. Uh, and and then also there's, we're moving the, uh, the one at Tropicana Fields, it'll be uh, moved north. Um, we'll have announcements on that soon, 
Uh, they're working out the final details and logistics of that site. Um, so testing is available. Uh, the turnaround uh, for the ones that we're familiar with, um, and, and it, it varies. If you go to different places, but depending upon the labs, the, the lag time in getting the test back. Um, but it's been fairly decent at the Mahaffey site between 24, 48, maybe 72 hours. So um, a fairly reasonable time period uh, for turnaround um, for, for your lab results. Um, the, the, I, I, will, I will say that the, as we um, kind of extend this out, the one issue with all these testing sites is the staffing, and that's key. The only reason I say that is uh, they, these are contract nurses for the um, ones that at the, both Mahaffey and the one that will be staffed north. Those are dependent upon state resources. So that continues to be a challenge, but so far it's working well. And community health centers, as we uh, put out this week, added night hours at three locations, Clearwater, Pinellas Park, Johnny Ruth Clark. And I'm so grateful for them for doing that. That that reaches a um, another segment of our population where they're, they're you know trying to work and have other commitments. All right. Thank you so much, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Thank you, um, Dr. Cho. I want you to talk about um, some T cells. I've seen that there's a new study out of Sweden and Germany, um, and I, I tried to look them up. I couldn't find them, but I found some other ones that discuss the T cells and and um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you had any kind of COVID in the past, um, even as much as the common cold, because COVID has been around for many decades, I believe, um, in various forms, that there's these memory cells called T cells and they have the T cell helper and the T cell killers. Um, and based on the, the first study that I heard about that these um, can protect somebody who from, from getting the virus or if they do get it, it's a minimal, it's, it's a fighter to stop it or prevent it from being a serious infection. Um, so the killers kill the infection cells. And I just want you to kind of talk about that. And then I'm curious, are we looking at the T cell stuff in, um, in treatment or in herd immunity? Because it's my understanding if, if you have a large population that has these T cells from COVID, does that not expedite hitting herd immunity quicker? And if you wouldn't mind talking about that. And I have one other question, Madam Chair, before I'm done. Okay, um, so with the immunity, uh, let's start with the ones that everyone knows about the antibodies. There are two types of immunities, as you sort of alluded to. Uh, um, there's a humoral um, uh, immunity, that's the antibody piece of it, as well as the, the cell-mediated. Um, in terms of hum uh, humoral uh, uh, immunity, um, that's the antibodies. And the concern that was brought up in recent studies does show that the uh, antibodies, in terms of detectable levels, um, <coughs> detectable levels may only have uh, appear uh, or disappear over within about three to four months. So, uh, so I, had, I did have some concerns when I did see that in terms of longevity of protection. But to your point, you do have this other system, the other immune system uh, with the cell, uh, with the killer T cells and T cells response that does have, have memory. And I think that will, and I, I think it's too early to say how big of an impact, but that should have a impact if, if the antibody levels do decrease uh, in terms of having overall herd immunity, as to the impact of that, I, I think it's um, yet to be unknown. Uh, yet to be known. Uh, I think more study and research needs to be conducted uh, on that. Um, and certainly, there, in terms of the the T cells as a therapy, um, I'm not sure what the research uh, is out there looking at it or stimulating. A lot of it has been the pharma uh, pharmaceutical medications. Uh, looking at things like uh, uh, the inflammatory pathways, looking at older medications as alternatives in terms of treatments. Okay, thank you. And the, the study I'm looking at looks incredibly promising. Um, we're 15 out of 18, it worked, and 34% uh, in another group. So um, that were uninfected, had the T cells. And so I think a large population already has those T cells. And I don't know when we're going to start looking at that when it comes to herd immunity, but I hope we do soon. Um, the other thing what I would like you to elaborate on is if you've had COVID, we're asking you to come and donate blood because we need your plasma. And can you explain why that's important and where in Pinellas County someone can go to give blood that they've, they've already had uh, COVID? I, I think it's critically important. And I spoke with somebody who has recovered from COVID and they're like, well, I think I have to go to Manatee County to donate my blood. I'm not going to do that. And I, I think we're not promoting that enough and why it's important and where the locations are. So if you can elaborate as to why it's important and then tell us where you can go to donate your blood if you've had COVID um, and why it's so critically important. Okay. 
so one of the promising therapies right now has been convalescent plasma. These are the people that have recovered from COVID. Um, having that uh, passive antibodies to protect somebody that, that's newly infected. Uh, the studies are showing that it's uh, promising, especially in the early course of the disease, more so than severe uh, disease. Um, and, but it's really limited to those uh, specific donations. I know uh, we've worked with the county and our communications group have uh, pushed that out. Uh, the point of contact has been uh, one blood and you can check out the web pages and we can certainly get that information out there. Uh, there is certain uh, criteria that you have to meet. You have to recover the past 14 days. I think you, you need to show some documentations of evidence of disease and or uh, antibody formation, uh, but it's all spelled out in that web page and we can certainly uh, share that with the public. So if they waited a month, it's too late? No, no, uh, no, it's a minimum of 14 days to my understanding. Um, but again, I think they need to show uh, and they will test again within their sites that you do have detectable antibodies because you need those antibodies uh, to be effective. Okay. okay, and the report that I'm, I'm reading also shows that those memory T cells are also there that will help long-term as well. So thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Commissioner Eggers has a question, Madam oh, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wrote you down and I forgot to call on you. Commissioner, Commissioner Eggers, you, you're muted too, sir. Of course, we had to do one. Thank you, Brian. No worries. Um, uh, just, I didn't know if we were moving on to the next topic. I just wanted to, just a brief update uh, on the CARES program, the, uh, where we are on the individual, the business, and then uh, there was a couple of programs that, that were rolled out yesterday. Um, and I know that's that word's getting out. So if we could just touch on each of those briefly, that would be great. Yes, Commissioner. So um, there's actually a program we sent out yesterday to you, but it's actually going to be rolled out tomorrow. Um, and this uh, really focuses around two areas. One is going to be a partnership with Pinellas Community Foundation. So us and the Community Foundation. We'll, we'll be working with our nonprofits. It was one of the key areas that was both identified in our survey and um, identified as part of your program that you approved a couple of weeks ago. This will push um, out funding for nonprofit organizations up to 29.7 million. This will include areas of food, homelessness, behavioral health, and legal aid for housing. Uh, the next area is on child care providers. We know early on that this was a key area uh, that were impacted by this program. Um, so you've identified $4.6 million available. We partnered with the Early Learning Coalition um, and to be able to push out grants to cover uh, one-time grants for cover expenses, such as employees' wages, vendor bills, rent, health and safety requirements. So both of these programs are ready to go. Um, they'll be launched tomorrow. Um, they'll be direct outreach. We, um, last night, we uh, Aubrey sent out to you kind of the summary of the various uh, programs, Many, uh, most of which are at some form of approval, uh, but the key partnerships with um, uh, the, some of the, the local grant program is still uh, in the final stages of development. We have Aubrey scheduled for next Tuesday uh, to give you a full overview of each one of the programs and its status, because we're hopeful by some of, by between today and tomorrow, and she was emailing me about 10 o'clock last night to be able to kind of finalize some of those uh, uh, details regarding contracts uh, for like the micro grants and some of those uh, areas. So they're very close to launching all of them. Those were two that were ready to go, and we're pushing out. Obviously, from the individual side, um, the, a major improvement has been that attestation form that you approved as part of this program. Um, so we're, we're starting to see some of the decline. Um, proof will be in the pudding as we, as we watch our 211 program, if that in fact speeds up and they're able to eliminate the back, both the backlog through additional staffing and also a improvements and ease in the, in the documentation required. Uh, we, we hope to see significant improvements within that program very soon. So um, if, if that's enough, I can certainly um, answer any specific questions, but we're going to give a complete overview of the program uh, next Tuesday from Aubrey. And Barry, uh, is it, are you, you think on Tuesday we'll also we'll be able to announce that new testing site uh, for uh, the north end of the county? I, I'm not sure about that. Um, we, um, we have to work with them regarding um, when they um, announce that, I think, yes, we should be, that should be out by Tuesday. Um, be close. Think, close. 
Okay. I yeah. So my understanding. I, yeah. I I only hesitate because we've we've tried to say let's get all the kinks worked out just like we did at the Mahaffey. Yeah. Um, and then um, after we said that we're not going to announce it, we had people showing up the next morning wanting to get tested. So <laughs> I'm very I'm not trying to be coy. I just I, I want them to be able to work the kinks out um, to where people have a good experience. When they come there, they can be processed. They can be processed quickly. Um, and even even the testing protocols and, and things, you know, and, and sites like this, you're bringing in contract nurses. Uh, typically from out of state, we have to get the you know the protocols and the documentation and throughput and how they how they take that and then process those uh, to get the labs and report those results. So there's there's quite a bit of um, administrative type work that needs to be able to go into a site running well. I have no doubt that they'll get there and just a uh, little hesitant to say exactly when. I think it'll be up and we should be able to talk about it by Tuesday. Okay, well, thank you. I just I, I had a meeting this morning with a, a virtual meeting with the Chamber of Commerce. There's probably 40 people on there and we were many of them were talking about uh, trusting and the transparency that goes on here. And I said, the only time you may not get that is when we're just not ready to announce something because <laughs> we don't want we want to be able to deliver on what we can. So I appreciate that. I know we have to be careful with it. But um, anyway, thank you for that update on the CARES program. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I, yeah, I think I would like to take this issue up and vote on it and then talk about uh, the next thing that's on our agenda, if that's okay. So I will entertain a motion. Commissioners, if, if I can, Commissioner, uh, you have two different options um, under the local state of emergency. So we, um, we discussed um, we can approach this a couple of different ways. So we have both this meeting and we have a meeting next Tuesday. You have a two week scheduled break. Um, we were kind of watching where we were at within this pandemic um, before putting a, a couple of options before you. It's certainly okay to schedule additional meetings uh, during that two week period, or you could delegate that authority. Joel is prepared for you two different options. You could delegate that authority to do extensions of the local state of emergency um, during this period, if you like. So um, I can certainly defer to Joel to, to, to explain the different options. Um, but uh, one of the two things we need to occur, and again, we don't have to make that decision today. If we don't want to, we could do it next Tuesday. But um, after next Tuesday, your next scheduled meeting is September 3rd. And, and just to be clear, what we, what we did for you all today, there are two attachments on your agenda. The first one is the order that extends the local state of emergency. You do need to take action on that today so that we can keep the emergency in place. Um, the second one, and we went ahead and did it as two separate resolutions, so you could take these two issues up independently, is we did draft a resolution that would provide delegation to the chair, or in the chair's absence, the vice chair or the county administrator, to do subsequent extensions of the local state of emergency. And again, as, as the county administrator referenced, you do have some weeks coming up. You have been stacking these meetings on a weekly basis for some time now. Um, I know we have some other things coming up that um, elections and other things that might make it a little bit more difficult uh, to get some um, meetings put on your calendars. Uh, so we are offering this to you as an option. And again, again, as uh, the administrator referenced, um, you already have a meeting next week, so you can extend the emergency for another week, obviously, at that time. Um, but this is another option for you if you do want to take that action. And again, it would delegate authority to the chair or, in her absence, the vice chair or administrator to do subsequent extensions of the local state of emergency, um, you know, until that point in time when it's no longer needed. If you do that delegation, there's nothing to say that the board couldn't take action on it itself when it is in a regularly um, you know, constituted meeting, but this would provide for some of those gaps. And it does not, it, so it does not allow for any changes to the ordinance, just an extension of the state of emergency, which we have been meeting every week for. <laughs> that, um, and this is quite a, an undertaking for the staff to put these up, these meetings up and to staff them the whole, some of, some of them very long meetings. Um, and if we don't need to do it, I, I would prefer not to. Uh, Commissioner Walsh? That's absolutely correct, uh, Madam Chair. This is only a delegation to extend the local state of emergency. It wouldn't delegate any other um, power 
uh, and I will tell you just for everyone's reference, this is uh, a delegation that we modeled after another county that did this very early on uh, in the process. And if I could add just one final thing, if something right. changes during that two week period and we need another meeting, we could always call another meeting if there was a significant change. So it doesn't prevent you know, anything, it just gives us that option you know, if you if, if you so choose to do that. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that explanation answered most of my questions. The only other question I had, it also had the option, if I'm reading it right, not only to extend the local emergency, but to dissolve the local state of emergency. I'm just wondering. Well, one thing to keep in mind, Commissioner, is mm -hmm. that the local states of emergencies automatically dissolve every seven days anyway, unless mm -hmm. you take additional action. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that answers that, but yeah, I mean, we put that in there. We can certainly take that part out if there's a level of discomfort, but do keep in mind, you know, obviously the reason why you're meeting every week is that at the local level, uh, we have to renew these every seven days or they would automatically expire anyway. I guess I'm not understanding. Does that technically have to be there because you're basically dissolving the existing and, and starting another no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. We could certainly take that um, that part of it out um, if you're uncomfortable with it. Um, I, I love the optimism that that would even be a possibility, <laughs> but uh, that's that's the only thing that that I have a little heartburn with. I would agree. I think we probably need to meet to actually dissolve it, um, Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, you know, I. I mean, he, I, I hear them. I feel the momentum going in one direction. And I, I feel, I don't know. I just feel like this is an important component of, of what we're going through in this County. And, uh, and it, and it does provide an outlet for, or an input, I guess, from our, from our residents. And albeit we haven't had as many recently calling in. Um, I'm also a little bit superstitious. So it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a baseball guy, so I don't like stepping on the white line when I go on the field. <laughs> Everything seems to be working well. We've got a rhythm going. These meetings don't have to be long. If we don't have any other thing on there, we get together just for that. We're doing it virtually anyway. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if it puts staff out a little bit, but I certainly wouldn't be comfortable just giving stopping the meetings, uh, regardless of whether there's a change or not. And it, at most, you know, uh, one week deferrent, so that we would do it for one week, and then the, the, the subsequent week we'd have to meet something like that. But I mean, that would be a compromise spot. But I just think this is a really good opportunity for our residents to feel like they can plug in at, at, at one time a week. So sorry, I don't want to beat that up. But that's just, I kind of feel the other way. So thank you. And I think that's probably a good compromise, Commissioner Edgar. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I completely 100,000% agree with Commissioner Eggers. I don't have any interest in transferring our responsibilities on this incredibly important issue. I would like to point out as well that we are living in incredibly challenging times and the world is changing and spinning on a dime. We have thousands of our most valuable treasures going back to school in, in another week as well as thousands of the very dedicated teachers and administrators who work in those schools. We don't know what the effects of that is gonna be. I am certainly really worried about it, quite frankly, given the number of grandchildren I have. So I'm not in favor of that. And I think we, it is our responsibility. We are elected leaders responsible to our citizens and. I take that very seriously. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Peters. I uh, concur with Commissioner Long on that. Um, we typically have either a workshop or a meeting every week anyways. So, you know, even though they have two weeks scheduled off, that's not the norm. We normally we meet every week anyway. So I don't see why we would defer the responsibility of that. Um, and I think even if a lot of people don't speak in these meetings, we should always give them the opportunity every week to, but we still have a lot of people that view this and the information that they receive from the doctors um, every single week, I think is critical. Um, there's a lot of people that have real high anxiety about this and it helps for them to hear every week from the experts. And, and I think it would be a mistake to not 
not allow that for them every week. Okay. Um, great. Um, if there's nothing more, let's take up that first, um, the extension itself. Move approval. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Egger, second from Commissioner uh, Welch, I think. Um, all in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries unanimously. Um, well, I'm hearing a consensus that we don't want to um, uh, delegate authority, so we okay. can move on. So we'll, um, I'll, I'll get with the chair and we'll schedule two additional meetings for those two weeks. Um, so we can, um, and that'll either be on a Tuesday or Thursday. I'll defer, you know, whatever is your pleasure. And uh, then we'll schedule those. Okay. All right. Next issue is comp plan update. And we have Rebecca Stonefield on the line. Uh, she's from planning and she will provide an update on our comp plan. And Rebecca, if you could go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom meeting so I know which uh, I'm not see seeing you right now. Rebecca, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you're under a different name on the Zoom meeting. That's why. Okay, I'm going to promote you. Give me one second. Thank you. All right, Rebecca, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, you should be good to go. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, people can see the presentation. Yep, queuing it up now. Excellent, thank you. So again, I'm Rebecca Stonefield. Uh, I'm with the uh, planning division of the county and we have been working on an update to the comprehensive plan and I just want to give you a status update of our progress. So the reason why we've undertaken this project is that our current plan was last, had, has last gone through a major update in 2008. As a long range document, uh, this plan tends to get looked at every eight to 10 years to make sure it's meeting the current needs. And since the existing plan has come into place, there's been a major uh, change to a state law, which allows us a little bit more local control in the drafting of the policies. Additionally, our plan is pretty large. It has over 1,100 policies throughout the document across the chapters. There is a, a, a lot of repetitive language. There's regulatory language that exists in the document. And I'll get into this a little bit more, but the, a comprehensive plan is really a policy document. And so we want to remove regulatory language and make sure that there are no conflicting policies across the many chapters. Also, the community is dealing with a number of changing needs. We're a built out community. We wanna make sure policies support redevelopment and not specifically new development on vacant land as that's not a, a real concern for us in the county at this point. And of course, we want to look at any new population or housing needs that we face. We wanna address sustainability and resiliency and make sure that is addressed throughout the, throughout the plan. So what is the role of a comprehensive plan? The county uh, as an entity has a number of goals, whether it's providing affordable quality housing for all of our residents, we want to expand job growth. There are a number of things we want to achieve. So the comprehensive plan essentially guides future actions the county will take to achieve those goals through the establishment of policies. These comprehensive plan policies feed and support the methods that we use um, in order to accomplish those goals. So whether it's through regulations such as the Land Development Code, whether it's the programs we choose to um, move forward with, whether it's how we choose to invest within the community, those are the tools that are guided by the policies within the comprehensive plan document that help us achieve those goals. So uh, we needed to start as um, this multi-phased approach to get to the point where we are, where we've been updating the policies. And we started with defining our community vision. And we did that through the creation of guiding principles. Currently, the comprehensive plan has over 47 or has 47 governing principles. And we really wanted to focus that message and streamline that. And we looked at a number of different existing documents. Um, we looked at community survey results. We looked at a number of things to 
streamline it to these eight guiding principles, which we've shared with the board a couple of times over the past um, couple of years. And we've also gone out to the public through a series of open houses, speaker events, presentations. We had an online survey to make sure the vision that, that kind of is defined through these principles is consistent with what the community wants. Um, and we have created a specific web page that shares that message. And we've had over uh, 3,000 views of that page when it was set up. So that was the first stage, setting that vision. And then the next stage was truly trying to understand what is in our comprehensive plan today. And we did that through a policy consolidation process. We brought in a consultant from the University of Florida who looked at every single goal objective policy that's in our comprehensive plan today and tried to streamline it and organize it in a way that we could understand uh, the specific message by removing repetitive language, taking out that regulatory language, or just eliminating um, information that is not necessary um, without changing the intent or meaning of what is said today. And what this did was set um, a foundation for this um, current update, which I'll uh, be talking through. Um, so I'll start by saying that these, these outer gears that you see in this illustration represent the broad categories that make up our community. And this is shown to illustrate the interconnection of these issues. You have housing, education, mobility, or our transportation system, jobs, and livability. And what we mean by livability is how do we improve, how, what are other factors that improve the quality of life of our residents? And all of these different um, all of these different components work together. You can't look at one without the other. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more over the next couple of slides, but I'm setting this up to say that as we were evaluating the document, um, we, we wanted to make sure it advanced our county initiatives, our, our, our equity and, and affordable housing and redevelopment, et cetera. And we wanted to make sure we also kept in mind this relationship of these issues. We looked at, do these policies support our penny four um, efforts? And we're also establishing metrics so we can look at the success of these policies as we move forward. So these next couple of slides is really, I just want to talk about this interrelationship a little bit because I think it's important. So when you look at for say, when you look at something like say housing options, um, you you can't look at that in a vacuum. You have to understand how these other factors impact those decisions. So for example, um, you don't just put housing anywhere. You want to make sure um, that you have it accessible to jobs. Does the transportation system allow you to get between your amenities and your schools and so forth from where the housing is located? Does the do the types of housing units, um, are they affordable to the workforce that lives in your community? Um, or do you have equitable access to your facilities, your parks and your resources, et cetera? And this, this slide um, is similar, but it's just showing you from a different perspective when you're focusing on something like say job growth, it's a similar thing. Are you, do you have a housing stock that have costs and sizes that meet the needs of the workforce that you have in place or that you're hoping to attract? Do you have a well-trained workforce that can fill the types of jobs you're bringing in? Again, do you have those mobility options to get a greater number of people to and from those jobs? And you wanna create places where not only employees want to work and live, but employers want to locate because they, they know it will attract the correct workforce. So you have this system, right? You have the vision as the core, the guiding principles that will guide the types of policies you create, and you have this, the consideration of these broad categories. And so the way the plan is made up is we have all of these um, chapters that address these issues. And you can see the direct correlation between housing. Our chapter is housing options, jobs, economic prosperity, et cetera. Livability, again, is all those other components that address quality of life, protection of our natural resources, the, the um, delivery of our services, how do we plan our land use categories, et cetera, access to our, our recreation. And so the process that we took to uh, look at the policies and update them was uh, we started from that policy consolidation or that streamlined version of today's plan 
we had all of the implementing departments review those policies and identify what's outdated, what don't we need anymore, what, what should stay, because it still supports our, our vision and our programs, and what's missing, what don't we have today that will help advance what we're trying to do. Once we got that information from our implementing departments, uh, we in the planning division drafted the individual chapters. We had to make sure we were meeting certain state statute requirements in that process. And then we had some back and forth with the departments to get it to a point um, where we were, were happy with each of the chapters. And what I'll say, what's not shown on this slide is that after we got to that point um, on the individual chapters, we shared the full document um, with all the departments. They had another opportunity to look at it as a whole, see how these different issues relate. And we're still kind of working through some final comments to address um, that version. So the result is a streamlined document. Again, I said currently we have over 1,100 policies. We've been able to bring it down to just over 300 at this point. And that's true for a couple of reasons. One is we've been able to focus our message a little bit more. We've been a little bit more direct in our language, um, as well as we're getting rid of a, some repetition. But the other key thing is in today's uh, plan, some things that are identified as policies are in fact strategies or those actions that help us carry out the policy. So there's a little bit more accurate categorization of things, um, but it is a streamlined version and um, that, that's where we are at the moment. So what I'd like to do is just kind of run through um, some of the key high, high level changes um, that are different between what's in the plan today and what we're proposing. So the plan strengthens the call for diversity in housing types, sizes, costs. It expands affordable housing funding options. It expands our um, commitment to local business and the workforce. We address uh, workforce training across a couple or a few of the chapters. Um, we call out safety as the number one priority in transportation, as well as um, stressing the, the opportunity for different multimodal options in our transportation system. It also addresses land use while recognizing the connections I keep talking about among housing and transportation options, accessibility to jobs um, and the other resources that the county offers. It focuses growth in activity centers and corridors where these resources really need to be concentrated together. Um, and it also emphasizes equitable access to the resources and facilities um, that the county offers. And we are also um, taking into account the Health in All Policies Initiative um, that the board uh, passed a resolution for. And we've added a new goal to incorporate health considerations into um, our decision-making process. It also incorporates or strengthens our sustainable practices across the board, not uh, across the different chapters, but especially as you know, it relates to our natural and coastal uh, resource. Um, protection. It expands the conversation around uh, climate change and sea level rise and calls for uh, the creation of, a, excuse me, a sustainability and resiliency plan and to make sure that we're considering the latest data when we make some of these decisions. Um, we also have our potable water and wastewater section. It's pretty similar to how it exists today, um, but we've added a policy that addresses sea level rise and how we plan for our our infrastructural improvements and making sure there's some resiliency in that process. And we're also call, similar to the solid waste um, section. It's pretty similar to what we have today, but we want to make sure that the program aligns with um, the recently drafted solid waste master plan. So this schedule is really our ideal schedule uh, with adoption occurring in the first quarter of 2021. Right now, we're still continuing to work through some of our, um, in, our internal comments and our next phase is going out to the public and we want to make sure that the document really is in its best uh, form, its most complete form before we go out to the public. So the timeline um, may not be quite as important as getting the content right. So there's a chance the schedule might be adjusted, um, but we're continuing to push forward on this project. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Eggers. Uh, Dave, are you muted? Sorry. Yeah, I always mute to make sure I don't say something dumb <laughs> while everybody's talking. So, and then I forget. So, apologize again. 
Um, really appreciate uh, us looking at the comp plan. I'm glad you took a step back to explain kind of what it is, because I think this was a good discussion if people understand what the essence of that plan is. And, um, and you touched on a lot of things, uh, just three thoughts. One is um, streamlining always makes me, the, the word makes me happy and nervous, um, happy that we're streamlining, it's efficiencies. And, but I wanna make sure we're not losing anything. And it, uh, I think you made the comment in here that it was neutral, so that's good. We did a streamlining of our categories under the countywide plan a few years ago, and there were some unintended consequences that came out of that. So I just want to make sure that we're not streamlining. We don't we don't lose anything. Um, secondly, um, you know, this pandemic, if, if it's not set, done anything else, I think it's brought to the forefront even further the importance of good health. And so I think obviously that being a part of this program is critically important. And I was thinking as I saw another Sunstar uh, truck going by or, or, or emergency truck going by that it would be kind of neat if we could put on the sides of those things, the different things that are important for health, like nutrition, mental health, physical exercise, doctor visits, whatever it is. So, so when it's driving down the road, it continues to let people understand how important those are. I know that's a little bit corny, but um, in any event, I think it's really important. And then the final thing that I just wanted to mention is underneath all of this, and it goes with, and it goes without saying category, that all of our comp plans do so for all people, right? So it's, it's without regard to age, without regard to sex, race, whatever, all of the things that are critically important that we just kind of say, well, of course it does. Um, somewhere along the way, I just think it's, a, it's another statement that says, you know, this county, we're not going to force people not to have Cokes. I mean, I drink Cokes, but, you know, maybe it's not the healthiest choice. Uh, so it's all about choices, but making sure that we have that information. And I do think for all of our residents to be, uh, to be empowered by this, you know, it's important. So just maybe some comment with respect to that in the category of it goes without saying, but I think it sometimes needs to be said. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Welch. <laughs> Commissioner Welch. It, it's catching, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, Rebecca, th you did a great job on this. I think we probably need to put this on YouTube because it's one of the uh, best explanations of comp plans that I've seen and it's very relatable. And I finally get the gear um, visual. The gears have to all work together. We talk about linkages, but I'm getting the gears. Um, so you've got uh, a Plan Pinellas webpage that's very well done. It's got the guiding principles on it. Is the draft plan going to be on that page? We are improving uh, a, a new unique webpage specifically to be the comprehensive plan document. Okay, so for now, the Plan Pinellas page as it is will have the consolidation and the guiding principles, but not, not the draft plan. Okay. Once we go to the public, the main form of contact with the document will be the new web page. Okay. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Carry on. All right. Next item is agenda briefing. All right. So, um, commissioners. The first item is the countywide. Um, this is the second hearing of um, the two public hearings regarding the rural residential future land use category that we previously discussed. Um, item number two is an ordinance. This is the needle exchange and Dr. Cho will be there to brief you on the parameters of that program and provide a brief presentation. Uh, items three, citizens to be heard. Um, then you've got circuit, circuit clerk of the circuit court. <laughs> um, he has a couple of items. You got receipt for file um, and mis miscellaneous filings. Um, over at item number 11, you have an award of a bid to Tanco Electric. Now uh, this is light duty uh, repairs uh, and this is in facilities. So it's with various facilities. Um, and this is a certified county small business enterprise uh, business, um, which, by the way, we haven't forgot about your program. 
Um, in fact, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Johnson's been very busy with um, processing business applications, helping us with our CARES Act funding. Um, but I did ask, she provided me an update. And so we will schedule a time at a, at a future workshop to give you an update on our uh, small and emerging business program. It's going extremely well. They met all of their program goals, actually exceeded their program goals in the first full year of that program. So be very excited to give you an update on that at a future meeting. Awesome news. Commissioner Gerard, I think Commissioner Eggers had a question on the last item. Commissioner Eggers. And you're muted, Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> I think I just maybe take a chance and keep it unmuted. Um, anyway, back to number six um, on the Inspector General's report, which I found a little bothersome and problematic. So I just wondered if we could possibly uh, get a report. It seemed like this was the second go around for the uh, Pinellas Library Cooperative operation. I was kind of a follow up on it and still issues with it. So if we could get kind of a report from a representative on that board and or have the executive director at some point down the road, not necessarily for Tuesday, maybe come and talk to us a little bit about, you know, kind of the issues that were that were pointed out and the progress or lack of progress that we're making in that arena. Just so one of our members on the board is Brian Lowack. And so I've asked him because they're looking at the uh, comments of the report internally with their executive director and with the members of the library cooperative. So I, I ask that following their review that they report back to the board of commissioners, um, either through a written report or actually coming into a meeting and explaining uh, the the um, outcome and uh, the, uh, the the fo their follow up to the report. Great. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Okay, moving on to item 12 is declare a surplus and sale of donated uh, county owned equipment. Um, as we know, we do send this out to our nonprofits ahead of time. Um, 13 is a um, so, uh, claim settlements for April 1st through June 30th. 14 is receipt and file. 15 is a ranking of firms um, for a lab out for our um, utilities uh, department. 16 and 17 are two new lawsuits we'll be defending. Uh, these are both liability cases. One is a trip and fall and one is an automobile accident. 18 and 19 are reports from the sheriff's office. Item 20, now that it's clear, is, uh, is an extension of our state of emergency. <laughs> so that'll be, that'll stay on. Um, Item 21 is an addendum to the agreement uh, with Florida Department of Health um, Operation PAR for the Healthcare for Homeless program. Um, these are two um, uh, addendums of supplemental uh, COVID-19 funding to enhance services and within the programs. Item 22 is a construction agreement and addendum between the county and Florida Department of Transportation for fiber optic cable uh, for our ATMS system and state roadways. And same on that same line, 23 is federally awarded sub um, award and grant agreement with um, Florida Division of Emergency Management. Um, this is Region 4 Hazard Mitigation Grant to provide about $6 million uh, to support hardening of our traffic signals at 16 intersections. <clears throat> Item 24 is an agreement with Keep uh, Pinellas Beautiful uh, for adopt a program, a drop. Adopter Program Management Services. Item 25 is our annual certificate of love and solid waste collection and disposal, the non uh, the non warm tax assessment role. Under the county attorney's agenda, under 27, um, this is an action where we are filing suit. We actually did file suit, or at least um, we're moving in that direction with the chair's authorization on an animal case that we needed to meet some statutory deadlines. Uh, so we're asking for ratification of that. Under 28, this is a case investigated by your Office of Human Rights uh, on housing discrimination. We are asking for authority to file suit there based upon a finding of cause. Um, and under number 29, you have actually seen this item before. This is coming back to you um, because of an issue. Somehow a 16th word snuck into the title of the ballot question or ballot language. 
Um, so we are bringing it back to you to correct that. Uh, did not feel that we should look at that as a Scrivener's error in all caution. Uh, the school board took action on this last week and we're gonna be asking you to reauthorize uh, that ballot question. Again, it's the same thing you already took action on and it would continue the millage that has been in place for some time. And I don't anticipate any reports at this time. The next item under county administrator's report, I will have two. One, we will provide a hurricane update um, or hurricane preparation update. Um, how about that? And uh, and a CARES Act funding update. Perfect. And finally, thirty one is a as an appointment reappointment to the Pinellas County Housing Finance Authority. Okay. Questions? Uh, I, just go ahead. Yeah, just really glad that we're we're really going to be looking at this coming year a trip and fall program. Barry, I, I saw that on your you know some of the efforts that you're going to be making because we continue to see these things pop up and they are expensive. And um, I just just in and I think I mentioned this before, but in all the walking that I do, you can see the problems. Now, some of times are in the city and sometimes are in the county, but I mean they're everywhere. I mean they're and whether they're an inch or two inch lips or you know, again, whether they're even marked, uh, you know, to show people that when it gets dusk that there's something, something there or whatever. But uh, really appreciate uh, that being a focus next year on in our in our plan. So Are we and, and you know, as highlighted by you know you commit and the other commissioners, um, you know, over this past year. But yeah, we saw kind of an uptick in that and and some of those suits. We went back and looked, and then you know they're they're doing follow up to try to uh, find ways of mitigating and uh, reducing that risk. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Commissioner Watts. Madam Chair, refresh me on our logistics. Um, the title says hybrid in person and virtual. Are we all virtual? Are we mixed? Let, refresh me where we are. Yeah, I'm not sure why it says hybrid. We are virtual next week, right? At the time that we had to advertise this, I do not believe that we had gotten the extension from the state of Florida. So we were um, somewhat hedging our bets there. And that's why it was advertised in that manner. We have now, of course, gotten the extension from the state to continue with these meetings until the end of this month. And so, but we will have it set up to where since we did advertise it that way, if people come in person, they will be able to speak to you. Um, however, you're right, you're correct in terms of commissioners being virtual. Okay, thank you. Takes even more staff to be present in the in the meeting room, Commissioner Long. Yes, <clears throat> and not the it, it's not pertinent to anything we're talking about today, but uh, Barry, for the for clarification. I saw your uh, memo on the status of where we were with the tides redevelopment uh, right. action that we've all received thousands and you know com communications about. But I wasn't clear about where we really are because is this something that just lingers on forever just because the developers don't come back to us? I wasn't clear on how that part works. Well, part part of it is is obviously we have to work with the developer, they're the applicant. Um, so, uh, it, but no, we have a staff recommendation. We fully intend on bringing that to the LPA um, and bringing this issue to resolution. The applicant, then the applicant will have a choice either to modify his application, at which time then it would have to go back um, through our review process, um, attend and and make it make his case or withdraw. Um, however, the what's put us in a, in a bind, obviously, is not having LPA meetings. Um, so those were deferred through the spring. Um, we are going to work with the applicant and with the community um, in terms of scheduling uh, for this fall. Uh, the biggest issue is we need a large venue, and, and that's not easy uh, to do to be able to properly social distance. Um, even in our most recent conversations, since you saw the latest com you know, correspondences, um, the, the community is going to work, but they want to attend, even though, you know, it, we're, we're dealing with a, a pandemic because obviously they, this impacts them and they're concerned about it. So we're going to have to work with both the community and the applicant. But no, it cannot just linger on. There'll have to be a decision made. We will bring it forward um, with our staff recommendation, as you've seen. Okay. 
Well, one way or another, I feel very strongly there needs to be closure on this issue because it's very consuming of everyone's time. And these folks are so anxious about it, just doesn't seem quite fair that we, we, they, I don't know who, who the responsibility lies with. I don't even care. I just want there to be some closure, some direction to be able to give these people some peace. And frankly, a lot of them are looking at very unsavory backyards. And I don't know how we move forward to clean all that mess up. Well, that, that's a separate issue from a code enforcement standpoint, and we are very aware of that, and we will work um, you know, with the neighborhood, ensuring that they meet all of our applicable, applicable codes. Um, but separately, we are going to bring it to the LPA. We are going to bring resolution to this issue, um, and that'll be done as soon as we can do the scheduling for these. And is there a way um, for some kind of communication to be able to go out to all of the folks that have been so concerned and so passionate about it. I mean, I just think that, you know, they send all this uh, information to us. It, you can't respond to it given the place that we're in, nor, nor can we keep up with the volume. I mean, there, I know our communication department has technology to be able to send a message to all of them. Couldn't we do something like that so they all know well, we, yes, and we will as, as, as we as we start to schedule this and kind of outline that process. The biggest issue with venues is even at, at St. Petersburg College, they've cut off outside groups from ex, from taking on their large venues. Now, I'll probably reach out to, um, you know, to their president and, and discuss this with them. But, you know, the, even where we thought we would have a venue to be able to hold something like that, we're we're running into some issues and that's at a staff level that probably needs to get kicked up to me um and then we can we can work on that but that is the process we are well aware of that now that we're um we we know that it's this is a long-term issue and so we're gonna have to resolve the lpa uh hearing process that's a key and we will communicate with the residents i did communicate directly back to the representative in terms of the issues that we're dealing with um but we do need to communicate with with the residents directly too and we will just as soon as we have some clarity in terms of a process okay thank you i just felt you know the need to bring that to to the forefront but i i appreciate it very much thank you madam chair thank you i appreciate the update myself um okay uh next issue is budget feedback so commissioners, we received um, two uh, requests for clarification. We discussed one last week, which was the uh, timeline regarding um, the data um, analysis piece on the mental health. Um, and then the second was one that Commissioner Eggers brought up uh, regarding EMS funding and how they uh, do that. So I have both Daisy um, and Jim Fogarty on the line, um, but we got we have a, just a short uh, slide that we can kind of uh, outline the timeline. Uh, for the first piece. Um, and so if Daisy's on the line, maybe you can kind of walk through this. And this is to uh, the, the timeline for this implementation, because I think we all agree um, on the approach. Um, the key piece on this is bringing community partners together. This has been attempted and we've made progress over the years, just not to the level that we want. Um, this is an effort to really bring that partnership and uh, to where we're focused around working on similar same data um, that we can then use to map out future steps, which would, uh, as you saw in the report, one of those being um, a coordinated access model, um, but that requires everybody participating. And so I have Daisy just outlining kind of a um, the, the process of, that we see and was outlined within the report, and then we can discuss kind of next steps. Hey, Daisy, can you, okay, I just want to make sure you could hear us. Okay, go ahead. Terrific. Yeah, good morning. And I'm not sure why my picture is not coming up. I only see my name. Um, but anyway, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barry. And, and thank you, commissioners, this morning. Um, as Barry had indicated, we wanted to uh, review with you the timeline, the projected timeline from KPMG on the optimal data set, formerly known as the minimal data set. Um, Recognizing that um, having this in place uh, it helps to define re required indicators. It establishes common definitions for data elements and terms. It will help specify the methodology for data collection and, and reporting. 
It promotes evidence-based decision-making and future state planning, and it helps to drive systems change and provide data for return on investment. So KPMG has projected that in the best case scenario, all things being equal, full participation, partnership amongst all the partners, and no unforeseen delays, that it would take 32 weeks um, to complete the, the data set and the, um, the different as aspects of the timeline in order to get to the official launch. You'll notice that several of these, um, several of these phases do overlap. So the first part of it, uh, the first three weeks, assuming that we would start in September, uh, I'm sorry, October, we would be establishing work groups with Pinellas County Human Services and Central Florida Behavioral Health, develop a charter and look at those guiding principles and agreement as a moving forward and develop a, com a comprehensive project plan, both together with, the, with human services in Central Florida to help move this forward. Also going along between October and January, KPMG estimates a 16 week period for the optimal data set development. During that time, we will be facilitating workshops with community stakeholders and getting some input from the subject matter experts. We would be developing the, um, actually developing the, um, the optimal data set and getting it ready for pilot test phasing, uh, testing phase, um, develop a communication and a change management plan for the providers, the staff, the physicians and also looking at the jurisdictional and leading best practices, standards of care, and, and determining the performance requirements that we would want. Starting in January through March for a period of 12 weeks, we would be defining the contract structure to tie in those optimal data set performance measures into the contracts uh, with, our, with our providers, and then develop the implementation plan for performance-based contracting. The final tw uh, 20 weeks, January through June, the longest period of time would really be around the data, data analytic tools, data warehouse with the interface to Power BI dashboard and the framework to input multi-agency data templates. And so if we, um, again, if we are successful in reaching these goals within the 20, uh, the 32 week period, that would be the time in which we would go ahead and launch the data set, either with selected providers or with selected service lines, and then be able to go ahead and capture and collect and evaluate data outcomes to help inform for the next steps. And I, I wanted to show kind of this timeline. That was the, the real question, commissioners, um, because we're, as I said before, we agree on the, we all agree on the coordinated access model but I can't make other nonprofits participate in that. They, we need to come together as a team. Um, and, and I think that the will, there's a willingness to do that, but we've, we've had our um, starts and stops before around this area. So it's, it's gonna be under the best case scenario using this, cord or this data set to be able to drive these decisions regarding how we set that up. In the, under the best case scenario, we're, we're looking into next year's budget cycle. Um, now, if we're wildly successful, which I really hope we are, um, and we are further along, again, part of, it's not just funding the coordinated access model, it's, it's how do we sustain it? Because it's got a $2 million annual um, uh, cost to maintaining that. And again, we've got to get three different nonprofits, their own board of directors, their own systems that they currently use to come together and, and have agreement. If we can do that, and we, then we can map out a process forward, not only for its development and implementation, but for maintenance that and, and get that agreement, we can always come back to you. We've set aside money, as you know, in reserves, but then we'll be able to bring people together and talk about how to fund these additional pieces as part of this process. Um, but we're going to be much further along in the pandemic. We're going to know where we're at financially. Um, and, and frankly, we'll, we'll see where, how this, how this coordinated uh, data uh, model works. And, I think we'll be in a much better position to make some decisions, you know, next spring uh, versus now. But but we all agree that that this that is the next step. We all agree that that is something we need to move forward, and we're hopeful that bringing partners together, uh, we can achieve that in a in a very timely manner. But that's that's the reason I wanted you to see the timeline and and the amount of work that goes into this data set. Understanding these common data elements um, and it is key and it's been key in dozens and dozens 
of cities and counties across the United States um, when they're trying to deal with mental health issues. Um, this is not uncommon and everyone started with data first to be able to help drive their decisions. And so that's where we're at and we look forward to working. Um, but that's the reason we made the budget recommendation as we did. Uh, Commissioner Peters. So Barry, um, because you've said over and over again, we have no teeth. Creating this optimum data set, how does we have any teeth to make anybody use this at all? Got to be a partnership. They, they, they'll need to participate in that. We can put that in, but if they don't use it and are not part of it, then you know, then then it goes nowhere. So I have said two times in the past in two different meetings that if we did have the coordinated access system and we funded it, then for them to be within the referral system, they'd have to use that data set. They have to. Does, do you disagree with that statement? I don't know the answer to that. Daisy, you could answer if you like. Yes, we would be putting it into the contract so that they would have to meet those that, that data set. So the only way that we would have a contract in which they'd have to meet that data set is if we had control over the access system, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Commissioner? The only way that we would have a contract that they would sign with us to use the data, the optimum data set, is if we had that, if we had the control over the community access center, that, that CAM unit. That's the only way that we would be contracting because by setting up this optimal data set, we're not, we don't have contracts with these providers now. So the only way we could have a contract with them to ensure that they use this optimal data set to ensure that we have true quality system of care, we would have to contract with them. And the only way I see us contracting is if we're in charge of the CAM unit. Am I correct? I think we're actually hoping that Central Florida will also require them to use the That's, state. But. I, I'm not asking, I would like to hear my question, right? So I asked if the only way we have power, teeth Excuse and control, me. and I was, well, I'm not finished, Madam Chair, and I would like to finish and then answer my question. I'm trying to answer your question. I was waiting on Daisy to answer my question. So Daisy, go ahead. But so yes, we have we have a portion of that. We're about we we have contract we do have contracts that are about eleven million dollars that we put into the mental health system. Daisy, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and uh, the, but the idea is the design of that is not going to be ready to where we can then do the contracting. You saw the performance based contracting piece was one of those final elements after we collect right. that data, and so we would use that information to design those performance based contracts. So yes, we could incorporate that into future contracts. We would hope though, that it would be done in conjunction with Central Florida Behavioral Health, um, which would, you know, I think everybody's in, in agreement and concept on, um, but those are the types of details that need to be worked through. So I, you, you said that we would have contracts with them where? Because I'm looking at the whole presentation that Lourdes gave us. Nowhere in this presentation does it say anything about doing contracts on an optimal data set and yeah, I don't know where you came up with that. I don't know where that came from. Daisy, can you, put your, you can put your slide back up. Daisy, where does it talk about the performance-based contracts? Let me just grab that. It is under um, the third phase, performance-based contract, January through March. And that's where the contract structure would be determined because to tie in the data sets as well as the implementation plan for the performance-based contracting with the and, providers. And the reason, reason that's important is right now, we're, we're just simply receiving outputs. You know, right now we receive that they process so many people and, um, but those aren't outcome-based. And so we really, so that data analysis phase is really getting to where we're talking about community impacts, community outcomes, individual outcomes. Um, and that's it. So that's a key component of changing the way we're reporting what we're currently doing. We're putting a lot of money into the, to the system, um, but we don't necessarily know the true community-based outcome. And so that, that is a key piece. That's where that would also be discussed in terms of how we do our contracting. So um, I don't, I, 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 just to finish that, um, again, if we don't fund the mental health, and I don't know where we're spending $11 million, and I would like it if Lourdes or Daisy would send me that data on the $11 million and what we're spending it and how, because I, I, that I have no idea what you're talking about, but um, how can you do performance-based contracting when it's the managing entity that does the contracting? 
So unless we create the referral system in which they have to, they have to uh, partner with us, there's no way that we can write these performance-based contracts with them if we're not their funders. Well, we are program we're providing. So we're part of that. And we hope, we hope to bring everybody to where we can structure not only our contracts, but Central Florida Behavioral Health. Um, and that's the whole idea of doing the data analysis first. And that's the reason KPMG said, absolutely, you need to go through that phase first and do the performance-based contracting as, as the next step. And didn't KPMG also said, say that we had to, at the same time, start the CAM project so that once we had that data set, we could, we could launch a true comprehensive coordinated system of care? No, they said that, in fact, you have to get far enough along within your data analysis piece and to right. the performance-based contract to begin right. I'm, structuring. I'm looking at the, I'm looking yeah, at the timeline. to begin that structure. And that's the reason we showed you that timeline. That, that, so we're right. not in disagreement. It's, it's whether we put money into this year's budget or not. But it's a, right. it's a next, you're not, it, under the best case scenario, it's next June before we're starting to design that process. And again, that's best pace. If we're not far enough along with the partnership agreements, well then in fact, it could be a little later. We're gonna push hard on this. We recognize the, the need, um, but, but we do need you know partner agencies to come and work with us on this. But didn't KPMG also say that it takes 11 to 12 months to create that CAM system before you can actually make it work? And then that goes to the point where if, if we, if it has to, we have to have the data analysis piece completed. Correct. First. Then but we start designing, on, and then we start designing that. And so if we're ready. Your, based on Daisy's slide, it takes eight months to have that data set finished and ready and contracts done and everything else. Eight so months, but it takes 12, okay. but, but let me finish. It takes 12 months based on the timeline that was given to us. It takes 12 months to get that CAM system up, ready and rolling. So that's four months after you're done with your timeline on the optimum data set before we would even be able to start the CAM if in fact we start them at the same time and do it simultaneously. Well, so if we're, I, if we're I, I am aware, Barry, Mr. That Peters, you, why don't you let him answer your question? I, please. If, as I said, if we're, if we're ready by next June, we have no issue. I have no issue with recommending and coming back to you, showing where we're at, what it takes for us to move into review uh, setting up this CAM system and how we would do that and the partners and where we're at, and then recommending we fund, we fund that next piece was the design of that out of our reserves. I, so I don't have be, any issue with that. So to be clear, in the last meeting, several commissioners said that they were under the understanding that we would be simultaneously doing this. And I just wanted you to be very clear. So your recommendation is to not simultaneously do anything, only singly do the data set. That's actually, what your proposal is today. I just want actually, you to be clear. Actually, it's KPMG's proposal is that, in fact, you do the data analysis first when you're far enough along in that, after you have the data, then you begin designing. It's like with performance-based contracts. You gotta have the data before you can do the contracting. Well, it's, it's, it's no different. If we're far enough along, then we that's when you begin to design and work on uh, the central, um, or the coordinated access model. And so that if that if that is in late spring, early summer, then if we're ready, then I said we come back and we discuss that at that time. Well, I'll be happy to send you the timeline and the data and the report from KPMG again to tell you that it takes three months just to develop the RFP. It takes another month and a half to release that RFP for submissions. It takes another three and a half months to evaluate those submissions that come in, and then it takes another three months to negotiate a contract with a vendor which puts us 11 months in. So you're telling me that maybe in the spring, we'll come back and then maybe we'll start that 12 months of RFP process so that in two years versus one year, we would have some kind of system up here. I just wanna be clear because I'm reading the KPMG report, it's right in front of me and I'm not making this one up, Barry. You said they're recommending that we do it after the fact. That's not the case at all. It's not the case I, at I all. We I don't implement it until after the data. And I just want to be clear. You're saying that in this report that's in front of my face, it doesn't say that we do it simultaneously for the RFP process because the RFP process takes 11 months. I'm saying that you have to be far enough along to be able to get, begin that process. Thank, design. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in, in reading all of this, information 
a couple of things came to mind. I, I think most of us or all of us are meeting with FAST and I had a meeting with them yesterday. Um, and I was frankly surprised. Um, you know, they were stating that there was a, this, this um, Pinellas Behavioral Health System of Care model that was out there that uh, they had a data set already. And my response to them was, you know, we've had several public meetings and workshops. Um, I think one was at the Lelman Exchange. Uh, and from what I understood, the mental health community was on board with this. And just as Barry said, it's almost like you need to build a foundation before you build a house on top of it. And having this optimal data set is the first piece. And again, we had our meetings were public, and I didn't hear anybody calling in from this group contesting or saying, look, there's an alternate plan or anything. So I think there's been some, some miscommunication, and, I, and uh, I relate to, to FAST that, you know, where have you guys been during the last couple of years when we've been talking about this? And uh, I haven't talked to Barry about it because I just received, uh, you know, I said, send me this proposal that you're talking about. And it's, it's much different than I think our direction is. For example, they're talking about a central receiving facility. We're talking about a model with multiple doors around the county. Um, it's in the consultant report. So um, my question is, tell us what this Pinellas Behavioral Health System of Care is and what their proposed model is. And is that, are the providers on board with us in the direction that we're going. I know that's a lot, but I just received this email uh, late last night after I met with FAST. So the Behavioral Health System of Care was established a couple of years ago. Um, Barbara Dare from Suncoast leads that group. It's a number of behavioral health providers that meet on a monthly basis to talk about some of the behavioral health issues and come up with initiatives. I understand that there is a group that is working together now um, to look at um, a centralized receiving system. And Service, that they, we're calling it. Yeah, and that they yep. have some work in progress currently. And I know that Lourdes has continued to encourage them to, to, to do the work and to continue working, you know, knowing that we were working with KPMG as mm -hmm. well. So are these competing models or does their model work under this concept that KPMG has given us? Um, they, they, there are some similarities in their model. And, and because we didn't know if we were going into RFP or not, you know, I, I, we didn't dive too deep into what their model is just to make sure that we weren't, that there wasn't any perception of, of um, any wrongdoing. But they I do think... have, they do have, uh, their plan does call for a centralized uh, virtual call-in and providers working with those individuals. And, and Commissioner, that's going to be key in designing this is to work with you know them. And so several of them, for instance, are hospitals. I talked to Tommy and Zena about this you know eight months ago, and okay. um, you know, and they're they're working on, it, but they're looking at it from their stamp their viewpoint, okay? And so we're gonna to have to work with them to where it works for the entire county and all of our systems. So, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a competing issue, but it, it certainly has to be integrated in terms of how we view. And we need to, as part of our model, look and, and get the information that they've gleaned in terms of how they would view um, their systems integrating into some type of a central access. Uh, so uh, the, I, don't, I, think, I don't think they're competing. I think they do need to be coordinated. And that'll be part of that design process. And one follow up, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. So Barry, so this doesn't, in your opinion, change your recommendation on moving forward with the optimal data set. This, this, this other work that's going on can work in that model. I, absolutely, I, I think it can. And you know, and I did have a conversation before I made my budget recommendation uh, with KPMG. So here's the way I'm looking at this. Here's the way I'm looking at the timeline. The response, and you know, again, you can get three people even on KPMG's team and, you know, they'll have different ideas, but they said that is absolutely a reasonable expectation in terms of timelines on how you proceed. Um, could we put money, you know, some money in and start designing uh, pieces? We can, but we can also do that by coming back to you and say, we're ready now. We've been wildly successful and the team's together and we're working as an integrated uh, model uh, and, and we're ready to move to this next phase. 
Um, I just know that our past efforts have taken a little longer than that. Um, I think most people in the country, as they've tried to integrate data, their efforts, um, all the best laid intentions take a little longer than they take. So it's really a question of whether we um, bring this back to you or whether we included it within the budget. My budget recommendation stands. I think we're all on the same page in terms of wanting to move forward and integrate the way in which we deal with um, our mental health services. Um, I just have a little different approach than some others would view it. And at some point we are reconciling the uh, coordinated access model with this centralized receiving service model and they, they <laughs> It's not an either or. I don't know enough about their work. Um, okay. I don't think that far along. I think that's a discussion point, but it absolutely has to be coordinated and integrated. They're they're a primary provider, and and uh, in fact, that referral system. They, you know, we know how people where people uh, access the system, and so they're the ones that are that are receiving people. So obviously, um, it has to be in a coordinated manner because they're going to be the ones implementing it. Well, and I have to say, I received a message this week from one of those key providers in the system of care group that is completely on board with what we're doing here, including the timeline. And they're they're cooperating and, and working together with us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Long. Yes, and I'm not sure if Commissioner Gerard's comments relate to the email from Barbara Adair, but I did receive an email from her last Monday. I see a couple of you shaking your heads. And Barbara so, is the head of that system of care group. Just wanted correct, to correct. And the point is, I hope everybody is listening to this comment. She says, I wanted to let you know that I support the original budget proposal presented to the commission outlining year one data collection and analysis and year two coordinated access depending on the results of the analysis of the data. I believe that data drives action in a responsible way. I also believe working with all of the behavioral health providers throughout this will be important as well. And that statement says everything you need to know about the philosophy coming from the mental health experts who have spent their entire career working in this field. So I hope we can move forward from this conversation and just keep on keeping on because clearly if it was that easy to fix, it would have been a, done a long, long time ago. Thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me share that with everyone. I thought it was really important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I think you had Commissioner Seal or Commissioner Eggers. Did you guys have your hands up? Uh, Commissioner Seal. And Commissioner Eggers, did you also have your hand up? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad that it was mentioned it was Barbara Dare. And it, to give it perspective, she's one of the few mental health professionals that did a merger in this county. And if you ever talk to her about that experience, she said it was very, very difficult to bring it about and to make it move forward. I highly respect Barbara. And if she has sent us an email to this um, intent, and I also received it as well, I believe that we are moving forward in the most professional and expeditious manner possible. And I also want to commend the chair how many years of experience did you have in the health and human services arena? Uh, um, 30 has, if anybody has some expertise, it is our current chair. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> real quick, uh, just looked real quick to make sure I wasn't muted again, um, that um, the system of health, system of care group, um, if you go to their meetings, you realize that there is some degree of coordination and, and conversation and planning and working together and yet even after all these years there are still you know conflicts or differences or issues that come up so to me uh, i was trying to think about it from a little different angle and, and barry maybe you can comment on this that i guess it's the million dollars if we invested the million dollars for the start of that phase two that next that next part 
what is it we're getting with that? Where does it actually start to work in what, what arena? And what is the downside? I think you, you, you talked about it a little bit this morning already, but I'm just trying to look at it the other way. So let's say we go ahead and do, say, yeah, that's, we're, we're doing it. We're still not going to do it at the same time exactly. But if we did, what's the downside? What are we doing other than perhaps causing a few more friction, a little more friction before we need to? Just your thoughts. <laughs> Well, there's no there's no downside. The issue is we need to be in a position to have the community partners together to move forward on a project like that. And so that's going to happen um, whenever it's ready and we're far enough along. We've got to get through our data analysis piece. We've got to see in terms of how people are um, working. And I think the performance based contracting piece that we discussed earlier, that's going to be a very difficult piece. Um, and and I and that really goes to the heart of the data analysis and why we're doing that. Um, so if we're ready, like I said, you know, you, you put it in the budget, it'll set there until we're ready. We can keep it in reserves and, we'll, and, and, and come to you when we're ready. Um, you know, either way, I, I, I think, you know, the, the commitment is we've got to get our, our arms around. We've got a pathway now. We've got a plan. Um, that plan now is, is, is our, our key to being able to bring people together, try to execute on it. Um, and so th those types of discussions need to occur. And so whether you put it in the budget, whether you have it reserved, I think it's immaterial. Okay. Uh, that, and again, I, I just, I think it's, I think it seems to me to be really important that, that we work together with this community of mental health providers. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'm just trying to think about getting the cart before the horse. I, and I'm also thinking about the, you know, the, the stick or the carrot approach. And it seems to me that this plan that we put together kind of says, here's where the county is, is going. Everybody get on board and help us develop this data set so that we can kind of move together um, and again, I, I, I'm just trying to, you know, you're trying to bring up a lot of people together under this one plan. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to oversimplify. I don't have the 30 years experience that the chair does in this arena. So for me, it's kind of that learning curve thing. I'm still trying to make sure I understand that it is this group that ultimately will be the ones that go after these RFPs, the ones that will end up servicing our community uh, in some regard. They're going to be a part of the system. And we need 100% buy-in uh, to make this truly work. And again, I'm just, again, question mark statement, Barry. Okay, Commissioner Peters. Okay, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Nobody says that Barbara Dare isn't wonderful. She is. She's an amazing lady. I have great respect for her. I have great respect for April Lodge. Um, I don't fly my flag very often, Commissioner Seal. But I spent eight years, six years in the legislature, and I completely reformed the entire mental health system at the state level. I'm the reason we can do telepsych now. I'm the reason that county judges can now refer misdemeanors to court. That whole Senate Bill 12 was my language. So you may not think I'm an expert on this subject, but I spent six years touring the state of Florida interviewing judges. And when I had started this, I didn't think to learn the, the system, the mental health system, that I would spend six years touring jails and prisons and talking to judges. I am here to tell you, I know more about this system than most people do, about the system. Not every single day of my degree is in child psychology, just FYI. So it's not that I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to ramrod something through, I'm not. According to the mental health study, um, and this is in the newspaper today about Largo's police department partnering with Directions. And Directions is doing this with many police department and it's really great. And in that article, it says, according to a mental health study, about 80% of all 911 calls involve something, so, someone suffering from mental illness, 80%. And I said last week, one in five adults, and we're not even talking children, one in five adults, 20% of this population suffers from mental illness. Complications by, all right, and if you look at next week's agenda, we just went through the agenda briefing. We, you, you all want us to um, do the needle exchange, right? Well, in that, document uh, in your Granicus thing, it says that complications from the current opiate crisis, hepatitis A has gone from 548 cases in 2018 to 3,408 cases in 2019, and a 50% increase in HIV cases. 
And I was on the phone yesterday with the managers of Axe, which is the only and the largest and the only Marchman Act facility in the whole region. And he said to me that every single person that gets a Marchman Act, 98% of them are dual diagnosed and are suffering from mental illness. So right now, the only thing that we are doing is keeping people either in jail or in crisis. That's what we're doing. And as a result of us not doing anything for those people that are dual diagnosed with mental health and addiction, we've had the most deaths last year, 423, way more than when you all closed down the pill mills, significantly more. We've had a huge increase in hepatitis A, a huge increase in HIV, because we're not doing anything to take care of the core problem. And instead, we're doing everything in crisis. We have more Baker Acts. I gave you the, the zip codes of that. What's interesting is the zip code of the Baker Acts, there's only one zip code of the top five Baker Acts, there's only one zip code that matches um, the number one, the number five zip codes for uh, Narcan administrated for overdoses. Now, we never talk about what it costs us in transports. None of us ever talk about it. I've asked for that data since I was elected, and I've never gotten a comprehensive data about what we're spending in transports. But when you have high numbers of Baker Acts and 423 deaths from overdose, because we're not willing to take care of the core problem of this. And so all I'm asking is that we put the million dollars in the budget this year. Barry has made sure that we have a large reserve and that we do the work. And if the data set takes an extra month, we don't launch it, but we're ready to launch it as soon as the data set is ready. It says in Daisy's timeline, it'll be ready in eight months, but it's gonna take 11 months before you can even get the contract to start it. And the startup isn't gonna be easy, it's gonna take a long time. And the longer you kick this can down the road, the more people are gonna die of overdose, we're already on track to beat the 423 deaths this year. The more people we're gonna have in Marchman Feds, the more people we're gonna have with HIV, the more people we're gonna have with hepatitis A. We're spending millions of dollars on, an, uh, on a pandemic, and yet we have hundreds and hundreds of people dying and getting other diseases because we refuse to address the core problem and kick the can down the road. So all I'm asking for is that we do the million dollars. Let's put the million dollars, let's do the framework. We have 10 months to come up with a solution on how to pay for the CAM system. There's no way that CAM system can be put in place in a couple months. It's gonna take 11 months to 12 months, absolutely 12 months to get it started. So we're talking about a million dollars and we have significant reserves just to, just to start that process. And then once the data set is done, if we need more time, we take the more time but we don't kick the can down the road for another year before we start the process, which takes a year before we can even start that CAM unit. And every single one of these providers, and we have great providers in this county, nobody said we didn't. Every one of them are gonna be on board because it's gonna be part of a new system and it's gonna help them serve their clients so much better. That system truly will ensure that there's a coordinated system of care in which there's a safety net and they won't fall through the cracks. And that's all I'm asking for is that we spend the million dollars now, we take 10 months to figure out how to pay it next year, and, and we don't kick the can down the road to make it take two years versus one year. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Please find another phrase other than kicking the can down the road and implying that none of us care but you, because we do care about this issue. That's why we're working on it. That's why we're allocating funds. And that's why we've talked about it in every meeting. Okay, I feel a little bit bullied by you, and it's enough, you know. Um, and I'm sure that the the providers would be thrilled if we act faster. The money is there if we act faster, if we're ready. We've said that. I don't know how many times you need to hear that, but the money's there when the system is ready to be implemented. Mr. Eggers. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I'm the kicking the can down the road implies that to, for me that nothing's being done. Um, so I, I, you know, again, I think that's not the case. I appreciate, again, the passion to get this thing moving. I think I can look at seven commissioners right now or six commissioners, and I, I think it's really important for everybody. What I had asked a minute ago, Barry, and you said, well, there is no downside to starting um, earlier so that we could do some of the work in parallel. I wanted to make sure that that's the case. If that's the case, uh, maybe we don't get all 11 months done. Maybe we only get six months done because at some point that, that next piece needs direct interaction with our, our partners. I, I, I don't necessarily understand that detail, but if we can save some time on the back end, 
by doing some work parallel that does not create animosity or, or problems with people, then, I mean, I, I don't know why we couldn't work in parallel. Now, on the other hand, if working in parallel presupposes and presumes certain outcomes and it upsets the apple cart and sets things back for when we do start that second phase, then, then that's a problem. I was just trying to understand, you know, what part of that plan could we get going that is kind of a pre it presumes that we're going to get to a point that data set and data information we've got all of that what can we have done if not the whole savings of 11 months what can we do to kind of move that in parallel do we have the resources do we have the people and do we have the partners that would say we're okay with that just keep don't get to any decision points but you know anyway just please so we're talking about we're talking about a RFP system and some of those lead items. The key is having everybody together talking and using data to be able to design a system. So you can't advance that. You've got to get there when everybody comes together, shares data, and as in from um, Daisy's presentation, and you get to a point where you have outcomes. Um, it's going to be those outcomes. Until you have that, you really can't design what you're trying to achieve through the coordinated access model. And so it's going to be that that's going to be the key piece. So if that occurs in April or that occurs in July, that's going to be key to being able to uh, begin that next phase. We're going to have staff on board. Part of the recommendation that we lost track of is we're dedicating two staff people to focus strictly on this issue. So some of those lead items, they can begin to work on those things internally. We can be prepped and ready and then pull the trigger when we're ready to advance for that next piece. Um, okay. So I don't think we're slowing anything down. I think it has to occur as it occurs, and, and the partnership needs to be there. And and I, I look forward to that. I think that we have a lot of people that are uh, willing and uh, wanting to see us move into a more coordinated manner, including our hospitals and and, uh, and providers. But that it's going to be when we have when we've advanced enough to where we can begin to design that next phase will will be when that occurs. So internally, we'll be going down that path over the next year as well. Uh, and at some point, it'll become a, a, a kind of a, a community effort, partnership effort to establish the RFP. So it, we might get started down that road without spending the million because that's internal and get that going. And then at some point, if we're ready with the data, we can kick in that extra funding to help us get through that phase. That that's correct. To design an RFP, you got to tell them what you're looking for, and you've got to have agreement in terms of the outcome and the design. And so we've got to be far enough along to be able to do that. Um, that's what I wanted. To say. Like, yeah. So that could occur sooner or could occur later. Um, okay, that's what I wanted to know. And and the fact that we might be moving internally a little bit to lay some groundwork for that discussion, I think is helpful. Might cut down on that 11 month. Might cut a couple months off of that when we're ready to kick in that next piece. So. I appreciate your taking some time to help me through it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, right. the next item we had is there was a question from Commissioner Eggers and I asked Jim Fogarty to go over um, the data-driven exercise that they used for EMS um, seats and how they do that analysis and how that plays into the tax levy, very pertinent to the budget. Um, and. I know Dave, you uh, met with them, or Commissioner Hager, sorry, you met with them, and um, if we can, um, but Jim is on the line and, and yeah. can certainly go over uh, that process. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate Jim doing that. Just a, a state of the EMS fund uh, financially would be good because in, in my questioning, um, uh, Station 65's request, um, it br brought up some of these issues, and I just thought it would be good for the commission to just get a brief state of the EMS fund which shows you know, lower balances than we would like in reserves out in year 24 and 25. The many, many chiefs and stations over the years have come to, come to working with a system that says, if you get certain levels of, of, of activity, that you get some EMS funding for those positions that you have. And station 65 is one of six or so requests this year. Not all of them are, are money requests, but six or seven requests for action based on what they presume um, is, is, is enough activity and enough, uh, enough level of activity. Um, 
one other thing that I asked for and, and tried to understand a little bit more, and I don't want to get into so many details that we lose the forest for the trees this morning, but there's concurrent incidents that happen in station districts, whether you have one incident going on at a time or two or three. And so all of this, as far as the station 65 is concerned, it's really important that you look at it from that perspective. So I just, I just wanted you know, appreciate Jim being here to talk a little bit about the state of the MS and then what these three, I think it's three monetary requests, station 65 is just one of them, would do to that curve over the next four years, I guess it was 24 and 25 when you started seeing some issues. So thank you, Barry, for putting that together. And Jim, thank you for being here this morning. Well, thanks, Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. I, You know me, I love talking about emergency services and EMS, so uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Brian, I'm gonna ask if you would uh, bring up uh, the spreadsheet that was provided by the Office of Management and Budget. But before we get there, I wanted to just quickly review how um, the behind the scenes system works. The, uh, the EMS system uh, contracts with the local fire districts and fire departments to actually provide the first responder service. And you, those fire de departments and districts really have multiple roles that they uh, perform. One of them, very important role is EMS, but they also have fire suppression and prevention and hazardous material and tech rescue. And um, to the extent that the district is responsible providing all those services, you know, they have to find ways within their budget to fund them. But the, to the extent that they provide the emergency medical part of that, um, that's a function of the EMS fund that we're gonna review here in a second. And the fund, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's designed uh, very efficiently to fund the aspect of the operations that are directly and specifically related to EMS. And for about five years, uh, there's been a group called the Data Driven Focus Group that gets together monthly and they look at the data and they, uh, and they, uh, they monitor the system and they decide um, just how is the system operating and are changes needed to the system. And that group operates from really some fundamental tenets of, um, of operations. And one of those tenets is that the analysis will be driven by data. It'll be driven by facts and it'll be driven by data that's generally based on annual statistics as opposed to daily or weekly or monthly. It's um, designed that it's applied consistently and fairly over all providers. Um, there's not a favored provider or there's a, um, you know, uh, connectivity piece. And so it's consistent and fair throughout the county. And then finally, that it needs to be sustainable financially for the long term. And that really has worked very, very well, at least for the last five years in monitoring and operating the system. And uh, the standards that the system is held to were created back in 2009 by a resolution. And that's the, you'll hear that reference, the resolution. The resolution has built within it what the allowable costs are that can be funded by the EMS levy and how many uh, paramedic positions that uh, can be funded based on not only call volume in that district, but also the response times in that district as well. And we monitor them and those are the metrics that we review. Uh, and as we prepare the budget, uh, usually in December or January, we look at that and say, okay, what if anything needs to change? And, um, and that all happened uh, this year. And what, um, what was unexpected, of course, is um, the results that would occur in terms of the response and volumes associated with the COVID. Um, the requests that um, were talked about back in January really contained really three system ads. And it's really a misnomer to say they're ads because the capacity actually exists in the case of Palm Harbor. Um, they have two units up there and each of those two units are, have one of the uh, three seats on those units paid for by the EMS system. Those are the paramedic seats. Uh, in the case of Largo Station 38, um, they have two units, but but there are there's one seat paid for by the by this by the EMS system. The other seats and the and the fuel and everything is paid for by the districts and the fire department. So it's a very efficient, effective system, both from an operational and a, and a, and a financial standpoint. And so the challenge uh, that we've faced is when we talked about this in January, some of the requests were really close to being um, needing to be funded. For instance, the Largo 38 request. Uh, it was uh, about 10.1 calls per day. And the cutoff point for an extra, extra funded seat in that case would have been 
10 calls per day, but it needs to be based on annual statistics. In the case of Palm Harbor, it was a little, it, it was a little uh, different, the uh, system up there, because they had functioned with two response units, Engine 65 and Squad 65. They talked about a different strategy, and we agreed to and accepted the different strategy would be to put a standalone two-person unit in that location and see what would happen based on the data and the facts, which in January of 2020, this year, uh, Medic 65 was put in service. And so really that's the way the system operates and I don't wanna to get too long-winded about it, but I would like to turn your attention to the, to the, to the spreadsheet that we have. This uh, was sort of a what-if analysis when we started the budget proposed and that's before you um, has um, no additional um, components for this fiscal year it's not that those fiscal, those uh, ads weren't considered. It's just they were, you know, held to the standard of consistently applied across all of the districts, and that it be financially sustainable, and that it would be based on annual statistics. At least for two of the three of those uh, those ads, were still um, subject to question. My, my guess is next year they probably won't be so questionable. We'll have an annual set of statistics, and we'll we'll know one way or the other. Uh, but we did a what-if analysis based on um, the uh, conversation from last year, uh, last meeting. Well, what would happen if we actually did those ads and what would happen to the fund? And this is what you see in front of you. This is the spreadsheet of that what-if analysis as if the budget as proposed were adopted. Um, Brian, if you would go to the uh, chart that's associated with this that says no enhancement chart. And what you see um, in this and the next two charts, you'll see in terms of the revenue growth, which is based on certain growth assumptions, um, and what you'll see in terms of the fund balance, which is based on the requirements of approximately 25% uh, uh, and funding balance of the uh, operational expenditures of the system, you'll see the, 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 the revenue um, doesn't change between the next three graphics, but the expenditure and the fund balance does. Again, this is the proposed budget as if there were no enhancements. And Brian, if you could go to the next, which says the 100% enhancements, uh, the, the, the chart associated with that 100% enhancements. You see, if we were to propose um, adopting 100% of the enhancements, meaning an additional paramedic position for uh, Palm Harbor District 65, and an additional paramedic position for Station 38 in Largo, and an additional administrative position for Pinellas Park, uh, those three ads would uh, add about $1.27 million expenditures to the fund. And so if we, if we put that in to the spreadsheet, this is what, what it would look like in terms of the uh, growth of expenditures and its effect on the fund balance over the course of the um, six year period we look at that. And you can see in the outer years, this certainly next year we could afford it. Um, and maybe even the next year we could afford it. And maybe the assumptions that this financial plan is built on, which are very conservative assumptions, perhaps they're not, um, you know, they'll be updated and it'll be better or perhaps they'll be worse. We, there's some uncertainty built into this. Um, but this, would, this is what it would look like if we adopted all of three of those um, ads. Um, and what the resulting fund balance would look like. And this is the conversation that uh, Commissioner Eggers and Craig Hare and I had uh, a couple of days ago. And you see that would result in a, a reserve fund balance uh, falling below 25% somewhere around fiscal year 24. And Brian, if you would go to the 50% the chart, this is the exact same thing, but if we took a different strategy, which we've done in the past when fiscal constraints came upon us where we said, well, what if we adopted only half of them this year and did all of them next year, what would it look like? And you, you see this, again, this is the financial view of what the plan, the fund would look like if we did that. Now, again, I wanna remind you that Palm Harbor as a district and Largo as a city fire department, they've already decided to put these paramedics positions in place. So it's really a matter of which fund pays for these. Is it the city funds? or the fire district funds that are paying for this system, or has it risen to the level of the resolution requirements to where now it becomes uh, an EMS levy commitment? Um, that's, that's what we uh, talked about, and I'll entertain questions you might have. Um, Jim, I was wondering if we could get a copy of those charts that you just showed us. So Absolutely. we can stare at them for a while. 
Uh, Commissioner Eggers, did you have? Yeah, just, uh, you know, again, um, you know, it seems like for some reason, you know, you know, number of number of trucks, number of ALS, ALS uh, provider in a system or trucks within a station, um, concurrent incidents. I know that I've, I've gotten had some conversation with uh, with the uh, one of the commissioners in Palm Harbor about you know, whether you have one incident, two incidents, or three incidents, and how that really plays into the importance of having three units in the Palm Harbor. The numbers themselves, the call volume numbers, are, are, are what drive, or are, are it's driving that. And so, I just want to make sure that you see that those those funds. I think the the goal of the fund is a 25% reserve, so you can see whether which whatever scenario, and he showed you three different scenarios. You're going down in each of the scenarios. It's maybe going down a little faster in one or the other. Back in 2009, as he said, they created this new system with benchmarks or hurdles that these folks have to get over so that they get some additional EMS funding. The thought was that they had gotten there. The thought was, I'm sure that the other two requests had gotten there, so therefore fund it. Um, it was that, you know, it was kind of made that simple. Uh, you know, Craig is, or Jim and Craig have tried to say that it's, it's more than just that. It's about the numbers. We need a year to look at it. This medic unit that they put in place didn't happen until January, for instance. And this will be a weird year to get numbers because if you remember back in April and May, the numbers were flat almost, and not flat, but they were very low because people were staying home. And then of course things have started to change a little bit. So those numbers are gonna be a little suppressed. So I hope when they do the number looking at next year, they remember that because um, so I think the group felt that this is a this is they had met the they had met the demand they had met the safety. In fact, they feel so strongly about it that they have the three organiz or three units funded with the help of two positions from the EMS group. Their argument is that a third position is warranted, and um, I'm still going through it to understand it. And I and you know part of me says we ought to do it. The other part of me says. There's a system, you know, Jim said that we need a year to look at the information, the data, I get it. Um, but I think we just have to, you know, stay true to this EMS fund that we created. And um, again, I, I don't have the historical perspective, some do, but you know, if you meet that volume and if you meet the, the response times, or if you don't meet the response times, you need some assistance from that fund, especially, it's obviously for medical calls. And so really, that's how the whole thing started. And then I you know, started learning more about the EMS fund, et cetera. So I don't know how conservative those, those numbers are in the EMS fund. I said, well, maybe we should just go for half a seat for the next year. And if the numbers get worse, that half seat may have to be pulled back. And if they get better, the other half seat can be added to your, uh, assuming that the numbers are justified. And um, their, their argument is that they were, the county said it was, at least this is what I was told by 65. So it's one thing to meet the hurdles, meet the things, get the funding. And then I guess there's a sense that, I guess that maybe that's not the case. You, 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 it's, it's more complicated than that. And I, you know, Jim, you know, that did his best to try to get through to me, the 65 people trying their best to get through to me. So I'm not, you know, completely understanding it all, but I do think that we, we have made a commitment that we need to stick to that commitment. And if we can't fully fund it, then we need to look at the fund, number one. If we can fully fund it or we're a little nervous because of the economy, then let's just partially do it with the complete upfront say, we may have to pull it back or we may have to add the other half in depending on how things actually turn out. I just wanna make sure those partnerships, we just talked about the mental health partners and these fire district partners um, are taken care of the way I know that Jim and Craig want to do. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that we're true to methodology. So anyway, just, I, I think it was important for us to have that discussion. Okay, thank you. I know there was some issue brought up at Largo's meeting last night too. Uh, Commissioner Walsh. Thank you. And, and thank you, Commissioner Eggers for walking us through that. Um, a relatively good problem to have that we're in balance um, at our 25% target through FY24. We were in much worse shape than this several years ago, as you remember. Um, I had a question on the spreadsheet, if Brian can bring that up, just a couple numbers that jumped out. I need a refresh. Sir, give me one moment. 
which scenario which scenario did you want to see commissioner it's the spreadsheet oh okay sorry so under revenues and you're really testing my glasses here <laughs> um, i think it's line 51 so there's a a refund which one am i looking at refund of prior years ex expense it looks like it's almost five million what what is that number yeah and I thought um, I saw Bill on here, so or or Jim. Yeah, maybe maybe Bill would be better uh, yeah. to answer that question. I, I think I know, uh, but I don't know that I know. So maybe I'll default to Bill. Bill, if you don't, I, I'll give it my best guess. And the second one is two lines down that COVID nineteen CARES Act of one point six million. Just want to refresh on that. Was that a different bucket of funds, or is it was it in the one hundred and seventy million bucket from CARES? I think we lost Bill. I've got Cecilia coming on too. If we need to well, see, well, it. let me let me try to let me try to uh, answer the second question first. I, I believe that was a second and specific uh, bucket of funds that was uh, uh, relegated to um, emergency services, specifically uh, that's associated with the acquisition of PPEs and some other things that the high levels and high volume of protective gloves and gowns that uh, okay. we've been forced to purchase. I believe that's sort of a se separate bucket uh, associated with that. And to answer the first question, okay. it's my understanding that every year annually, we do a reconciliation with all of our providers. And uh, of course our budget and what we've proposed they'll spend uh, isn't known until after the year's over with. And as we reconcile the budget to actual, there's uh, always a, a give and take from a, from a, a, a county's perspective. Uh, sometimes uh, they budgeted too light, sometimes they budgeted too heavy. Uh, but as we reconcile, uh, generally there's money due back to the fund from the various fire districts based on the budgeting process. And so I understand that's what that line item is. And that looks just particularly large compared to projections going forward and even last year. So just wonder what happened there. But again, it, it depends on uh, there. There were some there were some providers uh, that, based on some assumptions and some accounting uh, assumptions done with um, things like healthcare uh, costs and workers' comps costs, uh, they were they were larger than they needed to be. And then when we did the um, accounting of those on an annual basis, there were funds due back to this uh, to the county. And there are, okay. there are some specific providers. Each year, one provider has a little bit higher than others, and that's really usually a function of the of the budgeting process. And, and the city budgeting processes are usually uh, a delayed a month or two from the county. So, that, so as we propose the budget, it's it's usually a month before the cities are proposing their budget. So the assumptions, although conservative, aren't always accurate. So that's five million, and you're projecting about three hundred and sixty thousand going forward. So I was just wondering if there's one particular um issue that drove it for this year and i see bills on here maybe maybe he remembers but that one just kind of jumps off commissioner i don't recall what would have driven the uh larger number uh that's unusually high for the estimate for this year um i can certainly follow up with our budget analyst who's closest to that information and um, i know Jeanette's on the line as a clerk and this is uh you know an accounting convention the way that it's actually presented here Okay. Um, so Jeanette might have a little bit more insight as well. Yeah, uh, 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 answer later is fine. That's just fine. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on that, uh, Commissioner Peters? Yes, I know you asked us on that, um, which is good. But uh, Barry, in the future, when and this isn't the first time that this has happened in the future, there's no reason that they can't email that to us, to us even during the meeting. Um, I, I use an iPad on a stand and there's no way I could have read that much less had any kind of comprehensive questions since I didn't have a chance to see it, not in advance or at the time. So in the future, if anyone's going to present something that's not already in our Granicus agenda, can you ensure that they email that to us in advance so that we have it? So at least we can have intelligent questions to ask because we have the information in front of us. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Gerard, I think, oh, Commissioner Eggers has his hands up. I think Commissioner Seal also had her hand up at one oh, point. Let, let Commissioner Sorry, Seal. Commissioner Seal? Yeah. Um, mine's on another matter. So uh, I think Commissioner Eggers is addressing this and then call on me at the end, please. Okay, I will. Commissioner okay. Eggers. 
So, so <clears throat> my understanding is, is that we, the funding of this is not a problem, that we can do it. There is some concern in years in 24, 25, and 26 at varying degrees of, 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 of the problem under conservative anticipated, you know, very conservative uh, um, assumptions. So cities and unincorporated county areas that have this fire district and others are also anticipating millage issues over the next two or three years. So one way or another, either the, either the, the residents in, in the Palm Harbor case or in Largo, they're gonna pay for it through their millage or they're gonna pay through it through the EMS or they're gonna pay for it somehow. Because from what I understand, the three positions that are being asked for, it's felt strongly enough by those folks that they have it in place, whether it gets funded or not. Now, if it gets so bad on the funding, they may have to back out of one of those units. And that was why I was asking about the concurrency, the concurrent call issues. If they have to back out of one of those over the next couple of years, it could put them a little bit more at risk because some of the numbers that you see on the number of incidents, uh, when there's one incident and two incidents and three incidents, you try to be able to cover two incidents 90% of the time. That's what I understand. And that's critically important. But if they back have to back out of one of these systems and they get a third call, it, they, may have a, they may have problems doing it. So I just wanna make sure that, that the only question I had, Jim, before I make a, 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 com a motion, if you will, but I just wanna give direction is if we do this on the methodology that you're saying that we, we're, go we're maybe going against, and I, I don't want to go against methodology. I, I want to make sure we're doing it and being fair. But are you telling me if we did these three at, say, half, that we, we are disrupting our system of evaluation uh, as it, it relates to fairness with all of our partners? You know, I wouldn't categorize it that way. I would categorize it if you did, if you did one and didn't do the other two, you, you would likely be you'd be likely to be doing that. So I think consistency and fairness, and then also driven by the data as described uh, in the resolution. The resolution has clearly written within it that it should be based on annual data and our challenge is the annual data is probably not representative of what, of what it was two or three years ago. Because if you if you did a, but what the numbers you're talking about in terms of all related activity is a is a measure we call T stats or truck stats or how many times do trucks go on EMS calls, and uh, we did that analysis with T stats using July of this year as a surrogate, and July of this year and if you annualize that uh, shows that the Palm Harbor district has 14.7 calls per day in that district, and of those 14.7 calls, about 18% of them are somewhere else out of the Palm Harbor 6-5 district, whether that's in 6-6 or down in 5-3s or 5-0s. And so they're spending a significant amount of their response time outside of the Palm Harbor district, you know, which begs the other question is, is there a, is there a resolution in that those other districts? And as we each month meet and look at this, um, you know, one district may suddenly show if, you know, somebody builds a, a, a congregate living facility and suddenly it impacts a fire district, say Dunedin, and then all of a sudden next year, we may have an issue with Dunedin Rescue 60 as opposed to Clue Order Engine 50. And so that's, you know, that's the operational piece that Craig and I deal with each month. Um, but to answer your question, it wouldn't necessarily violate it unless we did one and not all three. And it, we would have to acknowledge that we're not doing it based on annual statistics. Um, I, you know, from my perspective, you know, I don't want to do get any consensus today because there's there's not, not everybody had information ahead of time. But I would like to revisit this before we go to the budget sessions in September at some point just to see. I would like to consider the three three positions at half, knowing full well that you know if things continue to go as badly or worse that those may have to come back, or if they don't meet those conservative uh, measurements that we go forward with the other half in the next year. Uh, I think that's something that we ought to consider. And I'd sure like to get uh, the com my fellow commissioners thoughts on it after they've had some time to absorb and ask their own questions of staff. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Long, is that on uh, this issue? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
Uh, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone of the difficulties that we have had in years past, evening out the fairness issue across this county as it relates to this particular budget item and how hard and how long it has taken us to get all the chiefs to come together and to meet continuously and to get on the same page and agree to a system that everybody could live with. And so my only comments are to caution that however we move forward, we're not establishing precedent that all of a sudden the rest of the departments are gonna wanna pile on with number one. We all know that they that you drive calls to run up your numbers in a way. And I think it's really, really important that we remember that in this county, many years ago, we moved to a mutual aid system where other uh, departments could come forward and cover some of those calls that when there were two or three of them doing the same thing in different directions, causing an overburden on one particular station. So I just say that to remind everyone of the very long history we've had in this county to ensure that this budget did not continue growing as it uh, has done in the past by 5% a year. So that's my, my biggest concern on these particular type of issues. And I just want to say one more uh, <laughs> thank you to Jim Fogarty and Craig Hare and all the chiefs who finally are working together on this great big complicated system of care, which by the way, is first class across the United States. Let's not lose sight of that as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, my first, one of my first meetings uh, <laughs> on coming here was with John Bennett. And, and, and John said, don't tinker <laughs> with, with this process. It was a, a rocky road to get where you're at. And just I just share that as a, as a, um, a word of advice from him uh, who, who lived in the you know, trenches trying to figure out a, mm. a system that works. Yeah, some of us lived on the other side of that trench. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't amen. fun either. <laughs> amen to that. So, um, yeah. So, so let me just ask one last question, Barry. Are we going to get a chance again? I don't. I'm not pressing it for today, but if, if we have to, I can do it in in, in the September meeting. But I'd really okay. rather. I'd like to revisit this for one more conversation. I know how those budget meetings go in September. They're very much pretty. You know. Let's just kind of get it done. We all the work leads up to those two meetings. So, how do you want me to handle this item at future? You know, to be considered in the future. If you if you want, what I'll do is um, based on the conversation today, I'll have Jim kind of outline that that process that they use, how they made the determination that they made. We'll send that to you in advance to Commissioner Peters' point, um, and then we'll put it on the agenda when sure. we consider the budget in September because really it's just coming out of fund reserve. So if you choose to do it or not, it doesn't really change the budget. Um, and so we can, we can have that for, for you at that time and then you can decide. Yeah. And in fact, we, I know we we're now going to have a couple, three more meetings this month. Maybe we could just tack it on at one of those oh. and just, that would give everybody time to adjust those budgets before we actually formally present them. Okay, um, and just you know, again, just get some additional questions from the commissioners, and and I'll have some additional opportunities to learn a few things as well before we get back together. Bill's got his hand going up. I'm <laughs> sure he's going to challenge me <laughs> on the process here. Go ahead. So uh, two different things. First of all, just following up on the uh, question about the 4.9 million, um, that as well as the one plus million in FY19 actuals are actually driven more by a uh, different process that's in place through the state, where there's a Medicaid public emergency medical transportation program that allows us to get reimbursement for costs through that program. And that, those extraordinary costs that you see there are non-recurring related to that program specifically. So that's what the nature of that particular revenue source. And that's COVID related? No, that is not COVID related. Separate, okay. Correct. Thank you, Bill. Um, secondly, as far as the process goes, while we can certainly make changes during the September public hearings, 
if we need to do that, that will be disruptive from a uh, workload standpoint in that typically our process has afforded us the opportunity to have everything locked down by the time we get to the first public hearing, which means we don't need to redo the budget for the second public hearing. And while the dollars remain the same, the mechanics within the dollars are changing and that drives a lot of changes within the actual budget document itself. So if there's an opportunity, as uh, Commissioner Riggers pointed out, to be able to address this during this month, uh, sooner the better, that provides us a better opportunity within OMB uh, to have a more streamlined process. Yeah, maybe we could, thanks Bill, maybe we could bring that back in a couple of weeks, Barry. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll put it on one of the work sessions coming up. Perfect, thank you. Thank you uh, everybody for, for listening. Thanks. Okay, great. Anything else on the, yes, Commissioner Welch. Just wanna ask Bill one quick question before he signs off. If, if he's still there, Bill, are you there? Yep, sure am. So are you doing dual um, input on your budget still, your new system and the Oof. legacy system? Technically we're not doing dual entry. Uh, what we're doing is we're running them in parallel right now. So we're taking all the data that was in Hyperion and porting it over to Questica, the new budget software. And we're going to be modeling out all the reports and everything in Questica and hopefully being able to publish the budget document using Questica as the source of the document. How's it going so far? We're doing well. Okay. Thank we're you. Still to, we're, we're still a little far along to know definitively whether we're going to be able to pull that off. And, you know, it's good to have a, you know, a backup option. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Okay. Great. And I'm sure you have Commissioner Seal still. I know. I was just going to call on her if, if nobody else. Had, Commissioner Seal, is this about the budget or something else? Okay. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, I don't know where it is at the present time, and I probably should have sent something out in writing, but I had a human rights board meeting on July 31st, and that was right after the budget information session on the for the commission on July 30th. And um, during that meeting, um, it was um, brought up that there might be a possibility of a need to amend the human rights budget to include a digital accessibility coordinator position. So as you recall, we pursued about website accessibility. And so they've been exploring ways in which to address it. And so um, I know Barry was surprised <laughs> and, um, yes. And I think they're going to have some more discussions whether they can use it from Paul's current budget or whatever. But I didn't want you all to be surprised if Barry had to bring this forward. Um, it's very important for us to do this because we need to make sure that we have our, all of our websites accessible to everyone. And Commissioner, the way I, the way I kind of see this playing out, obviously it's going to go to uh, the uh, committee, um, but you know, it also needs to go through our OMB process and needs to be reviewed. And so that way we can see what options they looked at. Um, are there other ways of providing service the same way we would do with any any decision package? Um, um, if, if at the end of the day it comes to you and they're requesting, you know, funding, then, then it, I, I would actually, depending upon the timeline, just take it outside of the budget process like we would, would with anything and it would just come out of reserves. Um, you know, or, or we ask for them to, we, we monitor their budget, um, see if they have turnover within their department. And, uh, and at the end of the year, if, if we need to backfill that, then we would do it at that time. But just such, you know, we can't budget all year round and it's such late time in the process. We really need to do the internal staff analysis on it, um, first. Um, so I'm not arguing for or against just, um, that we, we have some work to do, uh, prior to it coming. So that's the way I'd kind of propose that we, we address it. Uh, we will address it one way or another, and it'll come to you uh, either way. Right. I just don't want anyone to be surprised um, if it did come back. I was just trying to give you a heads up. But I do want to remind everyone that um, Paul Valenti and his staff do an excellent job. We have piled the wage theft right. ordinance with them. We, they've done a lot of work in um, video accessibility and translation. Um, just, you know, housing, you know, working with the city of St. Petersburg, taking over responsibilities from them without adding positions. So I really have to just commend 
um, Paul and his department. And then finally, I just wanted to, um, I mentioned this before, but I think our presentations on the budget this year, um, led by Bill Berger and all of the staff and then the individual departments were excellent. I mean, they were very thorough. They were very um, comprehensive. I think we had a lot more facts in front of us this year than we've had in the past. And I just wanted to say thank you. And um, finally, the only other thing I'm gonna say is, um, this has always been a collegial body, whether people disagree or not. And I want to commend all of the colleagues for moving forward on important issues when it means the betterment of our community. That's what we're all here at at the end of the day. But I would ask that we be respectful towards one another as we move forward because we're all in this together and we are trying to serve the citizens of Pinellas County as best as we can. Thank you, Commissioner Seal. Uh, Commissioner Peters, did I see your hand up? Okay, Commissioner Welch. Thank you. Um, very well said, Commissioner Seal. I just wanted to um, weigh in on the digital access position to say that the um, BTS board also discussed that and we were very supportive. It just, the timing, we didn't have our analysis complete um, in sync with the budget process, but the BTS board is very supportive of that position as well. And there was some question of where it would reside as well. And I guess it's settled now in Mr. Valente's area, but we're very supportive of that position. Just want to take that. Commissioners, this item will be on the BTS board agenda at the next meeting. Um, and, and again, the process for this has been that it's come up through the technical steering committee to the BTS board for consideration, even though the position would end up residing in the Office of Human Rights. Yeah. Hey. Yes, Commissioner Peters. I wouldn't agree that the place in which it falls is to be determined because I think there's more discussion to be had on that. And I think there's merit in, um, in that staying in BTS and, and being the cost being divided amongst everybody that's involved versus just going into one department. And that's, so that's not decided yet. We have a meeting to make that decision. And uh, I think that the conversation should be um, pretty robust. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else on the budget? Okay. Um, I just had one last thing. Uh, Jewel and I have been talking a bit about how to handle uh, public comment on these Zoom meetings. Um, and apparently many other entities that are having Zoom meetings right now have a cutoff time for public comment so that the person that's so that the Brian is able to project <laughs> how many people we have that want to speak on something, you know, how how long it's going to take. It, um, and I think I I would like to suggest, and I I think it's probably my prerogative anyway, to uh, that we put a cutoff time of 8:30 when we're start. Well, an hour before the start of the meeting, depending on what when we're meeting. Um, that people sign up not starting next week because i think that's something we need to let the public know about and you know put in our notices that if you want to speak on the zoom meeting you need to sign up ahead of time um, i don't think that's unusual and i think it is much closer to what we actually have when we're meeting in chambers you know when we have a meeting where we're all together we know pretty much at the beginning uh how many people are there to to speak on what topics and um, and what we're looking at. I mean, one of the things I'd like to avoid is the sort of conversation that we get into between the people that are calling in for public comment, because we'll have five people and they say something and then five more people call in <laughs> to respond to them. That's not really what it's about. It's really about you know communicating with us and letting us know what they're thinking not what they think about what the other guy said. Um, so unless, yes, Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, I was just, I'm just thinking through it just because, you know, I ran the last meeting and we had the section in the beginning, which you brought back, which is the, uh, you know, talk about something, any topic that's not on the agenda. So I was, I pretty much said, 
talk about any issue that's not on the under pandemic, so to speak. Um, and then when we got to the other part of the renewing the agreement, we had that discussion. So we had two separate opportunities. And if you sign up at 830, uh, Brian, are you going to be able to separate them out into two different kind of cues? Like this group's going to talk at the first and, 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 and this group's going to talk at the second part? I think we would have to come up with a process for what that sign up looks like, Commissioner, quite frankly, is that some, you know, governments are doing this a lot of different ways on this on these virtual forums. If we try to do that within Zoom, what it does is it requires everybody to register where right now we kind of have it open where anybody can come in and, and enjoy the meeting. Um, so I think we would need to kind of go back to the, the table and figure out what our process would be for actually having somebody sign up to speak. We want to make it as we want to make it as easy as possible for everybody, obviously, but also, you know, be able yeah. to get that public input. I mean, we could have an item on the agenda that's, you know, two hours into the meeting that mm -hmm. look, get right. public comment as well. So are they going to have to register at 830 also uh, for three hours later? Or how's that? I just want to make sure that we think through that part when we're, while we're putting this together. Hey, if I could just speak up and share a, a little bit of what we found in our research and looking at what <clears throat> other counties are doing, particularly our neighbors. Um, we're, we're, at least in the Tampa Bay region, pretty much an outlier. Um, the other counties are having citizens pre-register. And in going through some of their websites and just sort of clicking through myself, what, what citizens are given is an option to select the agenda item. So they could pick, you know, just uh, agenda item number 10 uh, and register to speak on that topic. Uh, what most counties are doing is opening up the window to register, you know, some set time in advance of the meeting, presumably, you know, obviously it would need to be after the agenda is published, um, and then closing it. Many of the counties are closing it the day prior to give staff time to kind of sort through those things, similar to the cards that your communication staff gets. And talking with the chair, I think if we... Um, if we were to go this direction, I think that staff would need at least an hour to sort through. Um, I'll call them the electronic cards just for purposes of conversation, because this would be similar to the cards that communication is already collecting if you're in person meetings. Um, but this is, you know, again, something that the other counties are doing. I think it would help staff, certainly help Brian trying to manage the speakers coming in. I think it would help the flow of our meetings hopefully eliminate some of the confusion on the citizens part that we've seen in the past as to when should they be speaking, you know, what's the proper way to do it. Um, and we would put directions obviously on the website, get, um, you know, word out as good as possible, but hopefully bring a little bit of a better flow to these electronic meetings. And frankly, they, they could sign up to speak on every item, on the agenda, God forbid, but they could do that. Um, what's happening now is that, you know, they'll ask to speak on the last item if they didn't get their word in. It's it's not, it's just not optimal. Uh, Commissioner Justice, did you have something? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I don't, um, I think that how you've done it in the past where you had to cut off everyone in by, you know, if we start an agenda item at 930 and you say, if you want to talk on this, you've got to, we're going to cut off input at 935 so that people can raise their hand or whatever they need to do. Um, I'm much more comfortable with something like that rather than you have to sign up the day before or by two hours before a meeting in the morning. That I don't know. That, that, that kind of makes me a little uncomfortable, just the feel of it. Just my two cents. I know, I, yeah, I know it's a change, and that may be a good idea if we, because that has worked the couple of times we did it, where we said, okay, the cutoff time is going to be um, five minutes from now. <laughs> you know, sign up or be quiet. Um, that's, yeah, okay. Commissioner Peters. So I, I don't agree with any of that at all. We had two, two callers today. Um, we haven't had a lot of callers in a long time and typically it's when it's something really big or pressing. Um, and I have no problem having to listen for hours if we have to listen for hours. Um, the citizens pay our paycheck. The citizens put us in office. The citizens can fire us at the next election. And I don't think that we should deprive them of one moment 
of public comment if they choose to share that public comment. So I, I wouldn't support registering in advance and I certainly don't even support squelching the comments. You can make it limited to, you know, they can't call back in. In the beginning we had some people calling back in um, and I don't think that's okay that they get twice at the apple at the same agenda item, but, um, but I would never take away opportunities for the public to give their input, regardless of what they're talking about. If they're talking about something on the agenda or something somebody said, I think they have the right to have us hear their opinion. That's just my opinion. Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Steele. Well, maybe I, uh, I think perhaps the Commissioner of Justice might have the best um, compromise possible that it still allows the public to um, have their voices be heard. But when you as chair have said, we're gonna, you know, 9.35, you have to sign up by that point. I think that's giving people adequate time. I don't dislike the idea of having people pre-register because I think it makes Brian's life easier as the moderator. So I think there's something that we can fashion that makes sure that we hear all the citizens in a very fair and fair way. So I think everybody's ideas were great and that we can come to something that works. Thank you. Okay, we'll work something out. Um, I kind of like Commissioner Justice's suggestion too. Commissioner Welch? For the record, I support Commissioner Justice's proposal. All right, write that down. Um, Mark it. <laughs> all right, okay. I like that idea. All right, anything else for the good of the order? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you all.